All right. Can uh, people hear me? I guess if you can hear me, maybe you can uh, post that uh, you've got it. I'll wait for a comment to say that it's uh, it's working. Yep, I'm assuming, Kurt, that means you can hear me. So uh, I guess we'll get rolling along. Let me pull up my notes here. Um, and let's see. Okay, so yeah, today will be a fun day. Last week was a session about uh, the basis of, of RFID, which, of course, when I was first building the system many years ago, um, I got good here, okay, good here. Uh, building the system many years ago, I dug quite a bit into, uh, you know, different components and how they all work together but that's been many years and there's not been like any revolutionary change and of course you know i'm sure companies will argue about that but um so chip timing rfid is, is basically been about the same so last week was a lesson that i was kind of wanting to get past but i needed to, to present it because there's a lot of people that that you know don't know some of the basics of, of chip timing and how it all works together and what components you know i hear people all the time talk about for example uh let's see if you can see this you know they call this the reader really this is the antenna um, it's just basic minor stuff, right? So I want to cover the basics with that um, that video. But today, this is where the fun gets uh, gets going because uh, you know if there's people here um, that use different systems or maybe you uh, are a new timer uh, or a timer's been twenty you know timing for twenty years, we're all going to do things a little different. And so uh, I think I could definitely watch. Uh, I would enjoy watching any one of uh, the timers watching this present. Hey, here's what I do to make sure everything goes well. So this is something you may hear uh, some things and hopefully take some nuggets out like, oh, that would actually you know, prevent some pro problems or that would erase half my headaches on race day if I follow Brian's advice here. Uh, or you may have a better way of doing something. So if I present something that you think, oh, there's there's actually a better way, um, put it in the comments here um, and then we can all learn from it. So uh, I've tried to make this to where it's not going to be too boring. So I'll get past this little intro here. Uh, and so, uh, let's, let's see how this goes. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone here for watching. Uh, this gives me a reason to shave every week. Otherwise, uh, what's the point? Uh, I think most of us are working from home. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a nice reason to, to, uh, to be doing these. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, we're at the point last week where we were kind of introducing chip timing. Uh, there's some people, a lot of coaches that uh, we sent the email to uh, that maybe have emailed us about chip timing, want to know more about it, uh, or just people that, you know, maybe you're running club or um, for whatever reason you want to know the basics of chip timing. So that's what last week was. Well, this week we're going with the assumption you uh, have purchased a system. So I think a lot of the rules, I, uh, or I say rules, a lot of the recommendations I'm laying out uh, are really good for any system. Uh, and so we're going to start off with you have just received your system. So what do you do? And so my recommendation, as soon as you get the system in, is to, to, to plan a date a week, two, two weeks ahead, whatever, where you're going to order pizza and invite every runner that you can, that you know, and then tell them about their runners. And even if they're not runners, you know, have their friends come over, everybody you can possibly get at your house or at the local track, which I know right now we're not supposed to be doing that. So, you know, let's just think about when hopefully this virus thing is done. Uh, so you want to invite as many people as you possibly can to come to your house and you're going to tell them, hey, we're going to try to break the system. Now, what that means, of course, is you're going to try every different configuration you can dream of. Like when I first was playing with chip timing, I would throw some tags on the bib and say, hey, let's let's run through in a really tight group as fast as we can. Or let's run slow, but even more compact, even more tight. Uh, let me try this over here. Let me try them on the side. Uh, so try your uh, you know different setups and see what works and what doesn't work, because race day is not the day you want to learn uh, what works or doesn't work. Uh, so my recommendation is to uh, invite, the, you know, Invest in some pizza, uh, invite everybody you can over. And so that does a couple of things. It gets you familiar with number one, how long does it take to set up my system? Number two, you know, what works and what doesn't work. Um, then number three thing it does is, is now you have a system and you're trying to form a business, right? So the best way to advertise your business, you know, you could send emails out blindly to people, but you're, you're a no name timer, uh, trying to advertise to races that are already familiar with another timer. And so. If you invite all the runners that you know over, which runners usually know race directors, and, and uh, uh, you know, if you invite people that aren't even runners, let's say it's a friend of yours that goes to a different church than you do or whatever, then of course, if that church is thinking about, hey, let's let's host a, like for example, my church did a series, um, like a six week series called a Better You Two Miler. Uh, that was the name of the race, but the series is called a Better You. And so like January first of whatever year that was, 
the preacher preached uh, like six weeks of you know different aspects of your life, uh, obviously spirituality, you know, physical fitness, uh, financially. So he covered different areas. And at the very end of it, uh, we had a two mile race for the entire church to join into. Now, the church was not at all interested in raising money. Um, and so it's really, uh, you know, they were doing it just for the to, for the series. And so, uh, you know, I, that would have been a great race for me to say, OK, uh, I'll take the proceeds of the race and give 50% here and whatever else. I didn't do that. Um, but the point is that that was a great race where the race director wasn't conter- concerned about making money. They just wanted a host event. And so if you get all these people over uh, to come to your system, or to come to your house and try to break the system, that advertises, hey, I know a guy that's got a timing system. And so it's a good way to kickstart your business and let everyone everyone know. And obviously you're inviting runners over. So, I mean, the word gets up pretty quick. Uh, And then, you know, obviously the objective is that they see that you care about, you know, learning how it works properly and that, you know, you know, they know you're going to do a good job. You don't just you're not just some random guy that bought a system and now is trying to jump in and do a race. So uh, that's, again, my recommendation is get some pizza, invite people over as many as you can get and try to flood the system. Um, And so I I think that's a good way to start. Um, Let's see. So the next thing is uh, after you get the system, of course, now this is before people show up. You're going to need to set the reader up in the software. Uh, so I'll show you how it's done in my program. Obviously, with different you know, decoders and different boxes, I'm sure there's uh, you know, different ways it's done. I don't, I'm not familiar with other systems, but I'm going to do a quick overview in case uh, you are new to timing uh, or considering you know, this system or another one, uh, just how to set, set the software up in the, in the system. So obviously different with other systems. So let me switch to the uh, display. So... In my software, there are uh, some readers that are automatically discovered. For example, if I plug in a Thinkify reader, which I have plugged in now, uh, I don't have to add it to the software. The software you see right here is searching for readers and just automatically adds it. And so um, there's no configuration. Uh, it's just easy. And so the, the, the Think Magic reader, which I don't recommend those readers. Last week, I, I meant to talk about products I don't recommend. The Think Magic is, is one that I don't, uh, simply because the, it's, it seems to have very poor build quality. Um, and so uh, it's, it tends to overheat. Now, again, this is a couple years ago, and I got videos on YouTube showing the difference between Thinkify and Think Magic. But uh, the Think Magic, we have to take apart every one of them because there's a wire that if you try to plug in uh, your cable to the external port, it'll rip the wire off on the inside without any hint that there's no locking nut on the other side. So it, it's just a, it seems to be a poorly built unit. And so uh, – but if you have one of those, you maybe you want to use it just for programming tags. That's fine if you already have one. Um, but the Think Magic, the Thinkify, the Sense the Ray or Sense This system, the, the race kit, uh, that's automatically discovered. The Alien readers are automatically discovered. Uh, now you do have to, to discover the Alien and Synthesis readers. You have to click on this play uh, play button here, and this will pull up a screen that will be searching for the readers. It'll automatically add it and automatically connect. Um, so just scanned a few tags there. Uh, so that's how you add some of those readers. Now with the append, um, or you can do it with alien readers too, uh, or even with the sensor array, uh, or the Motorola or Zebra readers. With those, you have to actually double click and add a new reader. And what you do is you can select the type of reader here. And based on your selection, when you click on the, the question mark button here, it'll tell you, hey, here's where you find this information I need. And so with Motorola or Zebra readers, uh, that that dialog box that popped up says, "Hey, there's a sticker on the side. If it's if it's a FX7500 or FX7600, uh, sorry, 9600, uh, or there's a sticker in the top if it's FX7400 or FX7500. And uh, there's different ways you can do it. If you read the documentation, you know the Zebra or reader, you know a lot of readers, uh, they go on the assumption that this reader is going into a warehouse where it's stationary. Whereas, of course, we as race timers, we may be swapping laptops." You know, randomly we may be, you know, we're, we're, we're unplugging it, plugging it in, you know, maybe switching stuff around every weekend. And so uh, there's, if you're a networking pro, the best way to go about it, if you're really comfortable with networking, is to set a static IP address on everything. Uh, it never changes, never any concern about it not connecting. Um, I'm a software developer. I know a little bit about networking. Uh, I tell people I know a little bit more than probably your grandma, but not a whole lot more. And so uh, I know basics of it. Uh, but me, I've never had any problem using the host name, um, and that's what I always use. And so here you'll see where I've set my Motorola reader up, and I've got it disabled for now. Um, but this is the host name, and I will switch back to the uh, webcam so you can see where to find that at. 
So FX, so this is FX 9500, and this is one I use all the time, so the sticker's kind of worn. Uh, but you can see the host name there, uh, you know, at the bottom. Uh, so basically, you just plug that in with no spaces, and that's the host name. Now, if this sticker is worn off to where you can't see it, then at the very bottom here, where it's got the MAC address, uh, that it's the last six characters of the MAC address. Um, and so you can plug that in, C6, you know, that whatever that says is the same thing here. But, of course, plug in FX9500. Um, the only thing you need to be aware of is if you get a world reader and it'll out beside the MAC address, it'll have a dash US or a dash WW. Um, it's actually out beside the pin number here. Oh, I didn't know this one's actually a dash WW. I thought I had a US reader here. But, so if it's a worldwide reader, you have to log into the web console, which is easy to do. You have to log into the web console and set the region of the reader. So, because different countries uh, you require to use different frequencies, so you have to tell that reader here's the frequency you're going to operate on. Um, besides that, it will work and uh, be fine that from that point on. Uh, Zebra readers uh, or Motorola 74, 7500, they have a sticker on the top, so that's where they and it's upside down. I think that's where it's at. And the same thing, you can look at the sticker on the bottom. Uh, it's on there somewhere. So it's the pin number. Last six characters. Uh, if Pam is an alien, again, um, those are in there. Uh, you can find that easy too. Uh, in the software, I don't have one of those readers with me. Just click on the question mark button when you, when you select that type of reader, and it'll it'll show you what to type in. Okay, so that's quickly how to set the reader up. Um, and so once you've got the reader set up, and before you invite people over to uh, to uh, to come break the system. Um, then we have to program some tags. So I've got a handful of tags here. I've got just random, right before the video started here, I got some random bibs with tags attached. I got some of those Feebot tags uh, that came with the mat and some two tags. I got it like 300 or 200 over here by me. So we're going to take a couple of these and I'll show you quickly. Now, different systems again use different methods. So uh, some systems will simply take whatever the factory EPC is on the tag and you have to create a cross-reference file to say, hey, this EPC belongs to this bib number for this athlete. Um, there's pros and cons with both. Uh, when I was developing this, I decided to make it to where you actually program the tag to match the bib number. So, if, for example, these tags on this bib, the EPC returns 1894. One of the benefits with that is that uh, I don't have to have my athletes in a race. I can program thousands of tags before I have a single race on, I'm hired to time. Whenever I get hired to time, I simply grab a, we put them in like a gallon Ziploc bag, it'll hold like 200 bibs, um, maybe more. And I simply grab a gallon bag full of bibs and tags ready to go, import my athlete, uh, athletes. Of course, the software says which, you know, what bib number you want to sign to these people. Or if it's done online or at dynamic bib assignment on race day, uh, they simply grab a big bib, plug in the number, or I, I import athletes, assign the same number, and that's it. So one of the benefits is that this tag simply returns a bib number. The software should be able to say, oh, well, here's the bib number. I know who the athlete is. Um, so we'll show you how to program tags in a second. Um, in fact, let's go ahead and pull it up now. So I created a race uh, called the the Art Live Stream 10K. There's actually an Art Live Stream 5K on Run Sign Up, and I'll show you how we're going to pull that in and, and get it all working together. But uh, this is the screen. You can do this from any race screen. So um, I'm going to click on this. Oh, I didn't realize you couldn't see my screen here. All right, so I've got the race pulled up. The button here at the top left says Program RFID Tags. What you'll do is you'll take a tag. Uh, usually I will take um, the uh, the tags and attach them to the bibs like you see here. Uh, and then I simply throw the bib on top of the antenna. And so let me go ahead and do that. All right, so we got uh, – let me grab one there. It's not attached to the bib. So I'll do this one here. All right, so uh, 1772. Um uh, it looks like I got my power. So one of the things with Thinkify is you can set the power at whatever you want. Uh, so let me go ahead and change that up to 100 because I know that I'm not going to pick up any extra tags here. 6% uh, is fine, but let me go ahead and bump it up. Okay. All right, so I'm going to change this bib from 1772 to just bib number, let's do... Let's do 201. Uh, so type 201. And let's say that I'm going to present another bib right after it, and I want the software to automatically increment this number after I program a bib. That way all i got to do is present a bib, enter key, present a bib, enter key, present a bib, enter key, and so on. 
Uh, I can either present a tag and click on the red X. And because what if you had, you know, a handful of tags and you really only wanted to, or maybe you got a tag in your house somewhere, you just cannot find it and it keeps getting picked up. Uh, then you can select just the tag you want. So here, let's say I want to program just this one. Then I select it and it'll change that to 201. Uh, and you see it automatically switched it to 202 here. Now, if you do like I do and put two tags on a bib, I can say, well, I want to, after, you know, I want to increment that number only after two successful writes. And so let's do these two. So now if I program and program, then you'll see that after the second successful write, it goes ahead, you know, switches it to 203. Now, one thing you also notice, I had two tags and now it only shows one. Well, the software in the reader can't tell the difference um, when the EPC is identical to, you know, two tags or 100 tags. It just, the reader simply gets that same EPC over and over again. So it can't tell if that's two or three or four. Um, Anyway, so that's how you program tags. So you want to get tags and bibs ready to go. That way, when people show up to uh, eat your pizza and uh, test the system, then you can hand them the tag and set up a dummy race. Um, but yeah, that's, so that's how you program tags. Now, I do want to point out one thing on this screen. Um, now, most screens of mine, I have a video demo link you see right here. This will obviously pull up a video that shows you uh, more detail than what I'm showing you now on how to program tags. Um, and everywhere in my software, you see a question mark button that you know, it explains, here's what this feature does. Um, so if you ever needed any help, then that's, that's, uh, what, you know, those are there for you. But I want to explain this right here. It says assign to this specific race. So I could program a tag, uh, let's take this tag here and make it, uh, 225. And I'm going to make it assigned to this specific race. Now you'll see the first four characters and maybe it goes to five are all zeros of the EPC. If I program the tag, uh, what you'll see is it puts the race ID as the first few characters. And there's only, I tell people you want to be very careful when you do this, because let's say that you have a 5K and a 10K going on and you decide, hey, I'm gonna make the 5K tags race specific for some reason and make the 10K tags race specific. Well, what happens is, sure enough on race morning, somebody gets hurt, uh, you know, week before the race or whatever, and they say, oh man, you know, I'd like to drop down to the 5K. Well, if they're, if they already have their bib on, and maybe they don't tell you that to after the race is over, and you're, you know you want to be a nice guy, maybe and, and swap their race form. Um, well, I guess at that point it's okay, but really where it's not okay is right before the race starts, someone comes and tell you, it comes to tell you that hey, I'm, I'm dropping down. Uh, you know, let's say you're set up and ready to time, you've you've already moved away from the registration area and all your bibs. Um, at that point, that person's bib, if you swap the race, it, it basically gets um, ignored. Uh, because now that bib is assigned to a race that, you know, it, it, um, that that bib number doesn't belong to. So uh, so anyways, just be careful with that. The only time that you'll use this feature assigned to a specific race is if you're timing. And there's maybe some other crazy scenarios, but the reason why it's in here is let's imagine that you're timing two races that are going on not really at the same time. Maybe they'll either overlap, uh, which I guess they wouldn't overlap. That Maybe, you know, you got like a... a uh, maybe you're timing laps on a track, for example, and maybe you want to do this for a 5K indoor and a 3K indoor. And let's let's imagine that the athletes are going to wear bid number one through 10 in both races. So now you've got two bid number ones and maybe bid number one and the 5K is warming up around the track where you're timing the 3K. And so the, if you're timing only the 3K, the software would know, hey, ignore that other bib number when it belongs to the, to the 5K. So that's really the one of the only few times you'll use this feature because you may be thinking, well, what if what if I'm timing like a cross country race and I've got you know bib number one through 100 in the JV boys, bib number 101 to 200 in the JV girls, and then of course you know higher numbers in the other races. Well, if if the races are not going to overlap, then uh, the software, if you pull all the races in. Uh, and you, you can start just one at a time to let the software know, hey, I'm only timing this one, but they're all available on the clock screen. Then if the software sees, oh, I just picked up 102, it knows that race hasn't started yet and it'll ignore it. So there's no problems. But let's say you didn't pull in all the races in the clock screen and you only have the JV boys and then bid number 102 in the JV girls race gets picked up. Then it'll show up as a red unassigned time, which is perfectly fine because it gets ignored anyways from the results. So there's there's a very... There's not really a good uh, example on when to use this feature. However, because I can see the possibility of someone needing it, it's in there. So just this is a feature that I've seen some people use because I think, oh, that sounds good. So assign this to this race. Don't use that feature. And in fact, I put that in here, like be very careful, you know, of when you use this. So, all right, I'm 
spent longer on that than I meant to. So um, let me leave you on my desktop here. I see a couple questions. I, I guess, Jamie, they were answered. They just disappeared. Um, so I'll keep going. So uh, the next thing is you've um, programmed your tags. You've set up your reader. You feel comfortable with your setup time. Uh, you know, because that's, again, one of the reasons why you want to invite people over uh, because you need to see how long does it take me to set up for race day because you're going to be showing up at like four in the morning or five in the morning if it's like an eight o'clock race. Uh, you know, maybe maybe six o'clock. Uh, if you're brand new to timing, uh, I would recommend showing up way earlier than you think you need. You know, if you're optimistic or even pessimistic and you think, OK, it's going to take me two hours to set up uh, and I want to be done set up, setting up before registration starts. Well, then show up 30 minutes before that. Uh, you know, go ahead and do two, two and a half hours. Uh, almost in the beginning, um, whenever I got into timing, almost every time I set up for a race, I almost always wish I had another 30 more minutes just to kind of double check everything, make sure everything's perfect. So you almost can't show up too early. Um, all right. So here's where we are. You've, you've got a system. You're comfortable with the setup time. Uh, you know, you're ready to actually do some live races and, and, and make money doing timing. Um, or help your community out, whatever your purpose was for for building building or uh, buying a system. So one of the things you want to do before you actually time your first race or start talking with race directors is you want to have some kind of contract um, that's ready to go, or you want to have a list, you know, some marketing document on uh, you know what you offer and you know what's included and what's not included. And so now everything I'm going to present uh, and and even more information is available. Uh, on my website here, this is under my resources folder. So now this is not like a link on the website. You actually have to type in agracesummy.com slash resources. So um, one of the things that is, is available there is our, it's kind of a, it's not a, well, I guess it's a kind of a contract because the race director does sign at the bottom. Um, but what it covers, I'm not going to go into great detail on all this. It just shows, hey, here's what we offer. Uh, here's what, you know, and this is actually kind of old because we we don't ask them to supply safety pins anymore uh, or registration forms because we do the paperless registration. Um, and we got you know we have a generator now, so we don't really require that they you know provide a power supply within 200 feet of the finish line. But if you're brand new to timing, if you're just starting off, maybe you're not comfortable yet setting up the the paperless registration and the dynamic bib assignment. Um, you know maybe maybe you're not sure where to buy safety pins. Uh, um, uh, you know, cleaner supply, uh, by the way, I think is where most people buy them from. But, uh, you know, so you may, you may still want to have some of these stipulations in there. We've for years, we've required, for example, a power supply within 200 feet. Um, and we've never had a problem with that. Uh, um, but, yeah, I'll talk about why we got rid of some of these later. But so this is kind of our, our letter that we send out, um, you know, asking for like, hey, we do ask for a $100 deposit um, to kind of lock your race into our calendar. Um, and then some of the other stuff that we ask for from them, then they sign it and date it. Um, and then here is our, our kind of our, our marketing letter. If someone wants to say, Hey, you know, we're thinking about having a race. Can you send us, you know, how much it would be and what all you provide? Then this is, um, uh, the, uh, the document we, we put together. Um, so feel free to look at this. If you're brand new timing, if you don't see what all we offer now, we offer more than what this document shows. Uh, and I'll go into that in a second. Um, but this is kind of, this is what we use. So, okay. So let me go back to the webcam view here. Okay. So, uh, for me personally, as you know, like a lot of you guys, and now by the way, this video is, there are obviously some big, big timing companies out there. And some of the things I say here, uh, maybe not apply to the way you operate, uh, the majority of timers, I'd imagine, are like me, where most races are going to be small to medium-sized races. So uh, if you're like me, uh, unless it's a really big event, you're going out by yourself. <laughs> I've seen some people uh, that are brave enough to have their wife go with them. And timing is stressful enough um, that that's, that's a really dangerous thing. So uh, you have to have really good, you know. Uh, type A personality, both people, uh, but also uh, to where you are not going to bite each other's heads off because race timing is stressful. There's going to be things that pop up, and uh, it's just hectic, and so that's a it's a dangerous thing. So, anyways, uh, so for me personally, I'm a one man show going up, um, and so the way I charge, even though you know we 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 offer a, a lot of features, and I'll go into them uh, here in a second, um, but I only charge for 
the actual timing. Even though I set up all kinds of features, a lot of features that no other timer in our area offers, uh, I provide those for free. And so I could easily say, oh, if you want the results kiosk, or if you want this, if you want that, it's X, this charge, that charge. And some races will go for it and some races will not. But I'll tell you why I only charge for timing and I provide everything else for free. Uh, so here's the reasons why. Um, so number one, it's a good practice for for everything, right? You want to make sure that your results kiosk, everything's working good. So it's a good practice. But um, but I even I, I set everything up I can like it's a big race, even for the smallest races, um, because race directors are often runners too. And so whenever I'm setting a system up, uh, I don't want a race director to show up at a race and just assume because let's say that a, a race hired me and they can only afford the basic of basics of timing, right? And by the way, we don't even offer manual timing because that's more of a headache, more of a stress uh, than simply showing up, giving people a bid, turn the readers on. I can sit back and enjoy the race. Whereas with manual timing, there's almost no work, very little work before the race, but it's, you know, you're, you're busy, you're tied to the race. Uh, I can't just let this into this thing. But anyways, um, so even for small races, we we provide everything uh, because if a race director shows up at my race, I don't want him thinking I can only do the basics. I want him to be wowed and say, man, look at this setup. Look what all you do. This is a really cool thing. I can walk over here and it automatically shows my my stuff on the TV so like my friends can take my picture. Or I, I walk over here and it automatically prints my, my, my results kiosk sticker where I can stick in the back of my bib as a souvenir or put on my medal. Um, and, you know, it's all touchless, all RFID. They just walk around. It just magically works. And so uh, and from their perspective, it magically works. And so uh, I do all this for free because, again, that, that helps. Uh, when I do this, I usually come home with two races. The race I just timed says, man, we want you back next year. This was the best value. And what you did was, you know, all these cool things are, are awesome. Uh, and then I come home with another race because someone walks up saying, oh, we're thinking about having a race or, hey, we do a race. And, you know, your timing looks you know, really nice compared to what we have. We'd like to talk to you about it. So um, that's your two best ways to grow the business. Invite friends over. Let's everyone in your community know you've got one. Um, and then number two, put on a big show. Uh, but so let me go into the reasons again why I, I do the features for free besides the marketing point. Um, yeah, I, the things I provide for free, by the way, is a tag check station so that during packet pickup or when people are dyna dynamically assigned their bib, um, yeah, they can walk over to a station before the race starts and scan their tag and it automatically shows their stuff and it says, let us know if anything's not right. Here's your name. Here's what age divisions you qualified for. We don't show their age. We just show here's the divisions you qualify for, which gives them an idea if their age is wrong. You know, here's your gender. Here's uh, the race you're in and everything else. Uh, all the critical stuff we have to have for the results to be right. And so we provide that. We do the, the touchless results kiosk and, you know, the automatic photo capture, which, of course, we upload uh, to run sign up, uh, which is free, which is you know awesome. Um, and then we upload the video, we, we record everything, upload it to YouTube, and then link that to the run sign up results page, which is awesome because now under their time, they see a video link. Um, we, uh, let's see, the quick results TV so that when they finish, there's a computer with a TV, big screen TV hooked up. Uh, it's automatically updating while the race is going on. And so as they walk up, they can stand next to the TV and basically – before they stand next to it, it says, stand here to have your photo made with your results or whatever. And so, you know, they can have friends or family that, you know, they walk up, it automatically picks them up, it shows their info, they take the picture, and the next person walks up. Um, then we do the, uh, let's see, instant results. Of course, we've got TVs that are on the finish line. Uh, we do have some LED clocks, but we, I like to use TVs because you can dynamically change it. For example, before the race, I can tap on the screen real quick, hey, parking in the rear building or whatever. Uh, or put just the race name up there. You know, a lot of things you really can't do easily with the LED clock um, or, you know, the traditional track style long clock. Um, and so we provide the quick results or instant results uh, to where they've um, got a TV facing the camera and camcorder the opposite of their, you know, where they're coming in. And then we have a TV at the end of the shoot that instantly shows their name and time when they finish. And so, um, yeah, a lot of people have that. I'm just saying what all we, we offer. Uh, the paperless registration, we set that up for them. Uh, you know, bring the computers and, and you know, I'll do all that. Uh, the dynamic bib assignment. Um, and then I'm kind of skimming through my list. I'm sure there's more uh, that we offer. So um, one of the other reasons why I don't charge for these things uh, is because let's let's say that you go to a race and they say, hey, I want that results kiosk and I'll pay you $300 or $250 to, uh, for you to provide that. Well, now – 
it doesn't matter what the weather's like. It doesn't matter if I had te technical difficulties. It doesn't matter what the reasoning is. If I don't provide it, then they can come back. You know, I got this awkward thing where it's like, well, she, it didn't work 100% perfect or, you know, whatever. Now, hopefully it does. I'm just saying, uh, then I have to worry about crap. Do I got to refund them? You know, it's just not a conversation I want to have to have. Um, and then again, number two is I don't want them to say I don't want it. And then me possibly lose that on, on hiring, getting hired for another race. Um, so yeah, if there's like weather conditions or time constraints or technical difficulties, I don't want to have to worry about setting it up if they didn't pay me to do it. Um, another thing is occasionally I have a race that tries to, to you know, let's say they, they, someone emails me today saying, Hey, we're thinking about having a race or we do this race. We want to consider you for timing. Now we're already, you know, typically half the cost of any time race in our area. But, uh, let's say that someone comes in and says, well, we, you know, this race, uh, typically is, you know, $1,800 because it's an overnight race. Um, and we want to see if we can pay you a thousand. Well, I like to, uh, and early on in the conversation, I'll say, well, I'll tell you what, how about I throw in XYZ feature and this feature and that feature? Usually they'll go with their original price knowing that they're getting these features, uh, that I was going to provide for free anyway. Uh, now again, I wasn't obligated to provide that. That's really the difference is that now they're paying full price and I have the obligation of providing them. Whereas before I was going to provide them anyway, because again, I want to do a good production. Uh, and so these features I do for free is a good way to kind of not get talked down from already a low price. And so, um, anyways, that's, that's kind of what I do. So, uh, take it for what it is trash or if you like it, maybe you can implement it. Um, I'm not reading my notes. Somebody skim through, make sure that I didn't miss anything. Yeah, so I was going to talk next about recommendations. So this is where it's going to get interesting on the forum, and I'll stop and read questions after this. Uh, again, a lot of timers out there have been timing for a long time, so uh, this is where I'd like to have your feedback. So I've made a quick list of things that I think if you're if you're new to timing and you don't have some of these items, you could be absolutely miserable. Because think about it. You are you're showing up early, a couple hours, three hours before a race. You you're tied to one spot and you're setting up your finish line or whatever. Um, and then while the race is going on, you are stuck right there in that tent or that tent area. No matter what's going on around you, you're stuck. You got to stay there. So imagine that it's uh, a Fourth of July race and you're in the south. Well, I guess mosquitoes are anywhere. And you are stuck in your tent. Maybe it's early in the morning. And you're trying to set stuff up. And mosquitoes are so thick that you can't hardly breathe. I mean, it's the way it gets in Arkansas sometimes. And so imagine you didn't bring bug spray. I mean, you are stuck out there. So not only is it miserable setting up and things are going slow because you're having, it's just terrible. Uh, but you know, you're stuck while the race is going on. You're in, yeah, at the finish line table. And so if you don't have bug spray, uh, you could be in a world of pain. Um, Another recommendation is you want to you want to make sure every time every time they go out and this may seem weird but you you want to have some towels some dry towels. Imagine that you're timing a race and let's say it's three hours away and uh, it starts to rain and let's say that something gets wet your reader gets wet or some electronics get wet you want to be able to dry that stuff off before you put it in your vehicle to travel that far because I mean the longer it's in the high humid environment uh, it's not really the best the best thing for us so. I like to have towels. Maybe maybe your table gets wet that you're going to put your laptop on. Um, you know, maybe you're at the registration area working that. It, you know, something happened, table got wet. You can, you know, obviously fold it over and get most of the water off, but then you want to dry it off a little bit. So having some towels is, is always handy. Um, another thing that's almost always handy is tape. You know, sometimes you want to tape something up, and maybe the racer's trying to put up a banner, uh, you know, maybe some zip ties, you know, stuff like that. So it's always nice. Because as a timer, by the way, last week I mentioned about how you know, don't get in timing if your if your objective is just only to make money. Uh, usually you're you're doing it because you're trying to help the community, you're trying to help the local races or whatever. Um, because one of the things you're going to do, like I mentioned about helping put up banners or whatever, you're going to do more work than you're paid to do. So uh, if you're the type of person that's going to gripe about that, if you're not the type of person that like is willingly say, oh man, can I help you with this? Again, timing may not be your thing, so or just may not be as fun. And so you want to bring some stuff to be able to help them. Uh, and they remember that stuff. And so um, another thing here, so yeah, that was tape and zip ties. Maybe it's just a few, um, you know, good gorilla tape or whatever, you know, good good adhesive stuff. Um, and another thing you want to bring is some toilet paper, your own personal roll. I don't know how many times I've been in a race and let's say, let's say it's a marathon or 50 K or whatever. And of course they have like one porter potty. And so you're, the race is finally slowing down. You can kind of like, okay, we got like five minutes between finishes here. All of a sudden 
your body comes awake and says, hey, buddy, it's time to do some business. And so <laughs> you go to the porter potty and you, there's nothing there. So it's always nice to have your own personal role. Um, and then on top of that, when I'm at a race, you know, I, I can I show up super early and I'm a busy bee. I'm just moving and I'm, you know, I'm all over the place. I'm I'm making sure everything's going perfect. And so I like to bring some water and some snacks because sometimes I get to the point where I'm running around making sure everything's going perfect. I'm, you know, doing whatever. And I find myself at the end of the, some of these races uh, where I'm like, man, if I had to pick up 20 pounds, yeah, you know, my arms are going to cramp and I just can't do it, right? So I'm just wore out most of the time because I don't take time to drink water. I don't take time to eat snack. I'm just, I'm just wherever I need to be. And so it's always handy in case there wasn't anything to snack on or any water. Bring a bottle of water, bring some snacks. Uh, just kind of give yourself a little pep if uh, if it's been one day. So. Uh, another item I'd recommend that you stash away somewhere is you want to bring a little umbrella. You never know if you know you got sideways wind and you're trying to time and it's trying to blow in on your electronics. Uh, umbrella is never a bad thing. You know, I usually bring a, a plastic tub. It's about, I don't know, you can't really see it, but about as wide as this here. Um, and it's got all my tiny stuff in it. And if it starts to rain, I'll put it in the plastic tub, all the electronics, you know, my power strip, everything, and then cover it with the tub and then put that under my table. That way, you know, rain's got to go through quite a few barriers to get to it. But uh, you never know if you're going to do like a chip start or something else where, you know, having an umbrella propped up sure does come in handy. Um, almost every timer has got like a little either 10 by 10 or 16 by 8. Yeah, I've got a 16 by 8 tent, you know, so you can cover your stuff or get out of the sun or whatever. Um, one of the things that's real cheap, makes a big difference, is go to Walmart and buy you that sealant spray that you can spray uh, on that because if you buy that a lot of people buy the cheap you know ninety dollar pop up tents or whatever and yeah everyone knows that lasts like a season you're lucky to get like two three seasons out of a top tops um, but if you spray that stuff uh, with the the silicone sealant that'll help keep the rain out because uh, there's nothing worse than you're timing a race you've got the tent over you and just every now and then a, a drip will come just randomly through the through the through the material at the top there, um, and just get on you know on a keyboard or whatever. And so if you spray that stuff, it'll stop most of that. So get the seal uh, the silicone sealant uh, and spray it on the tent. Um, you want to bring a little headlamp. Uh, most of the time, you as the timer, you're gonna be the first one at the race site. Uh, so having a little headlamp so instead of using your phone or whatever, uh, and you, you know usually it's gonna be dark when you show up. So have a headlamp. They're they're cheap, um, and so that's that's always handy. Uh, I would not bring, one time I bought a little lantern, a lantern that you can set up somewhere. Uh, the problem is it, of course, disperses light everywhere. So you're like, you, you know, you can't see anything because, you know, it's it's just, it's, I would I use a headlamp. So um, you're going to want to dress like it's 20 degrees or 15 degrees hotter or colder than what it's really going to be. So it's wintertime. You want to dress like it's going to be 15 degrees colder than what the temperature is going to be. Because, again, you're at the race site. And you're stuck there. You don't have the ability to kind of walk around and get yourself warm. Now, obviously, you can walk around some, but for the most part, you're stationary. And so you want to dress even warmer than it's going to be if it's in a, a springtime or a summertime race where the temperature is going to be, you know, above 80. Then you want to dress like it's going to be like a 95. Um, uh, it's just, yeah. So be prepared for that. So, you know, bring, you know, hat, gloves, sunscreen, stuff like that. Um, and my final tip because there's been plenty of races where I had to park in one area and then have to go down a long trail to get to the finish line somewhere else. And if you're having to carry a whole bunch of stuff, maybe it's your uh, your timing mat. You know, those things are not not light; they're heavy. Uh, maybe it's uh, you know big tripods for TVs and whatever else. Uh, I, uh, in fact, I can pull it up. On, it's on my website here under uh, on one of my pages. It's got the little wagon I use. It's it's got big wheels made for like beaches and stuff. Um, and so I can stack a lot of stuff in there and just drag my wagon behind me. I'm not having to carry all these individual items. And so, um, okay, let me read the questions real quick and they'll jump on to, uh, what you do. So that's kind of the thing is you need to buy, like, here's the, yeah, here's a typical box of safe pins. I'm sure everyone's familiar with these. If you've been timing for any amount of time, um, before your first race, one of the things I provide uh, is I provide bibs and everything. I don't want the race to have to worry about anything. It's not so much the race worrying about it. I don't want me to have to worry about the race forgetting some of this stuff. So, you know, some bibs. And by the way, I got to give credit. Uh, this company sent me, he's a, a user. I don't think he purchased the software. I don't know if he uh, has a couple of systems. But there's a website at the bottom. So they um, provided these bibs. But you want to have bibs, you want to have safety pins. Uh, because again, I don't want the race director to show up race morning and 
he freak out because he left the bibs at his house three hours away, right? So I provide everything I can. So uh, you, you want to eliminate all the variables you, you can if you're a timer. So sometimes it's better just to eat that cost uh, or pass it on or whatever, and you provide everything. Now, of course, some races are going to have custom bibs. You want to get those, like you maybe tell them, hey, I want these two weeks before the race so I can get them all prepped and ready if you need to. But um, All right, so let me answer questions, and we'll move on to – uh, to the next phase, which is, okay, now you actually have a race. What do you do leading up to the race to make sure everything goes well? Um, so questions. Let me read them real quick here. On the hue tags, can you describe the label? Okay. So this guy is saying, hey, can you explain how we do the hue tags, how we label them, how we make sure we get them back, uh, and all that stuff. Um, so... With all the tags, what you'll see here, in fact, here's, let me just do this because this one's easier. So with all the tags, we use wet erase marker. And so a dry erase, you can rub your finger and it comes right off, right? That's a problem. Uh, so you see it's not coming off. The other problem is if you use a permanent marker, then if you want to get that number off and reuse a tag, you have to get like alcohol and wipe it off, either this or this. And so with a wet erase, now don't, I don't want to gross you out here. You get it a little bit wet and it comes right off. See that? A little bit wet. Oh, that's the wrong one. And it comes right off. I mean, just it comes off like dry erase if you get it just a little bit wet. Now, again, that don't gross you off. And I'm not supposed to do that coronavirus stuff. I know. I haven't been out of my house in like weeks, so don't freak out. Anyways, um, so we use we use wet erase markers to label everything. That way, we can easily wipe it off. Um, so that's one tip. Uh, as for getting them back afterwards, we have a big plastic tub at the finish line. Now, with a couple things we do, number one, we do set up the results kiosk. And so we have volunteers in there. Now, when you set up a results kiosk and people get, I wish I had the sticker with me. Um, they get that little sticker that comes whenever you just walk up. Uh, that volunteer, their job is to say, hey, in order for people to get their sticker, they have to return their tags. And so if you have a results kiosk where people know as soon as I finish, I go get a little cool label that I can stick wherever. Everybody goes there. And so... That's one thing that you can do to kind of funnel people in because as a runner, if, if you're thinking like I think, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. Whenever I finish the race and at that moment, they're like, hey, buddy, slow down. Let me take your tag off. I hate that. And in fact, that's why a lot of race directors, if they say I want disposable tags and you ask them why is because that's, they have that image in their mind. And so when I tell them we use reusable tags, either this or this or whatever, but I say we don't impede the finish line. We let them run on through. We simply say before you leave, we want the tags back. You know, I, I, I joke before the race, um, you know, previous announcements. I say, hey, if you need to go throw up, if you, need, if you want to cool down, whatever you want to do, this fine. Just before you leave the race, we want these back. And, you know, I say it keeps them out of the landfill, keeps everyone's cost down. So we want them back. Um, and then so that's one thing I do to, is results kiosk. That's where you return them. We have a big plastic tub that we actually write shoe tags or hue tags or whatever on the side as another reminder. Hey, if you forgot them, here's another place you can return them. Um, and then the final thing I do is I use the email feature in the software, which we'll look at in a second, to send everyone an email saying, hey, if you mistakenly went home with your tags, here's where you can mail them back. Now, these are so cheap. It costs, you know, it actually, you know, one stamp is also going to cost them. And they can stick these in a small envelope, stick them in the mail and mail them to us. Um with these, you can easily take. In fact, let me let me show you. Uh, I can take I can take a big tub, a few tags, and just simply uh, pull up, uh, make make a copy of the race, um, make a copy of the race, and the software will say, "Hey, do you want to move all these athletes over to it?" Yes, uh, and then I can basically retime the race by scanning all the tags through, and I can see, okay, who. Uh, doesn't have a time, right? Uh, and that means I don't have their tag here. Um, and there's different ways you can do that. You can also, if you use the paperless registration or the dynamic bib, bib assignment, you can tell, here's who checked in. And that's one of the features, by the way, in the software is when I hit sync, it only pulls in people that actually checked into the race or that were, was assigned a bib member. And so let's say you had 200 tags, like like we've got here, 200 few tags, but you only gave out 160, um, then you can look at the, the, the ones that only checked in and compare that against the actual tag reads. You should get uh, the one or two that didn't return them. At that point, I'm calling, I'm emailing or whatever and say, hey, uh, you know, those are $7 a piece or whatever you paid for them, so I'd like to get them back. Um, I don't threaten them to charge them. I don't do anything. It's just You're going to be hard-pressed to find someone that says, man, I just want to keep that tag. 
most people are honest people. If you confront them and say in a friendly way and say, hey, man, you know, we saw that you may, may have went home with your tag. You know, these cost quite a bit. Can you mail it back here? Uh, people are happy to do it. So, OK, Muhammad, let me see. I would like to know if he used Matt antennas and see what configuration he recommended for triathlon, for example, with the tag. Um, as you can know, passive are not very good at high speed or with the back reflections that will need mats. Uh, so you will need mats. Uh, so we've always timed triathlons. Now, I didn't get a mat antenna until just a few weeks ago, the, the Feebots, uh, or however you say it. I'm pretty sure that's right. But, um, we've always used the side panel antennas and never had any issues at all. Uh, like I mentioned last week, you can flick a tag in front of a, an antenna as fast as you want and it's going to pick it up. Um, the... And plus with most triathlons that we've timed, every triathlon we've timed, they have a, a spot right before the antennas and right before, and our antennas are right at the beginning of the transition area where you're supposed to dismount from your bike, you know, then run in uh, past the antennas into the transition area, do your transition and then go back out. So even, even if someone is, maybe they finish the swim and they're biking out real fast, that's probably the fastest they come through on a bike. That's still not like 25 miles an hour. I mean, they're, they're, they get on the bike and they're coming through the transition area. Of course, it's the transition area. There's people coming in. There's some movement there. So typically people aren't, um, you know, at full speed in the transition area. So we've never had a missed tag uh, or problems with the bike. But I've got videos on my YouTube channel um, where I go through every step and how everything's set up. Um, so that's we've never had a problem. We've never needed felt the need to use mad antennas for a triathlon. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers that question. Um, can you adjust power of the reader uh, on Think of Uh Yeah, so right now, um, and this is an easy change, I just haven't done it yet. Uh, right now, you can only adjust the power uh, on the Thinkify reader in the software. It's a really easy thing for me to add other ones. But, you know, when I add one, I want to be able to do all. So that's the only reason why I haven't done, like, the Zebra readers, because uh, I don't want to... <laughs> And I know I just said that I do do one and not all, even though you can only do think about it. But, you know, it is a little bit more testing. I just have to break off a couple of days and say, let me do, you know, what I think is the appendage. I don't have an appendage reader. That's one of the problems right now. Um, and so uh, I will do that. But right now it is only think about Now, by the way, that power adjustment only occurs on the on the screen where you program tags. Uh, when you pull up a clock screen, the software by default is going to tell it to operate at full power. So. Changing that power doesn't doesn't do anything on any other screen but the programming tags. Uh, Mohammed, again, do you have a possibility at the end? Uh, okay. Do you have the possibility at the end people take a photo with the time and they make the timer display? Just put an RFID reader at the tag. Yeah, so that's what I was talking about earlier. The and I can show that next week is when I'm going to dig into all the kind of luxury features. And I'm going to show, hey, here's how to set this up. Here's how it works. I'll go ahead and pull it up today. Um, but, yeah, so it's called – I call it the Quick Results TV. And so it is a, something where you can put an antenna, you know, 10, 15 feet away or whatever is outside of the view of the camera if you wanted to and just have a TV there where people, when they walk up, it automatically, boom, takes – you know, take the picture. Sorry, it automatically shows their stuff on the screen. Uh, all right, next question – uh, what is dynamic bib assignment? Greg, I love the question. Uh, for years, I didn't use it, even though I had other, heard other timers talking about how great it was. Mostly because, you know, most people are like me, right? If, it's, if I can know I'm going to get good results doing this method I've always done, even though I know it's not the most efficient way, but that's just what I'm comfortable with, that's what I'm going to do. Finally, I took the dive into going to dynamic bib assignments, uh, and, uh, the paperless registration. And I'm never going to go back if, if I can help it. And there's very few races that ever say or that where they're in a spot where there's no cell coverage, no Wi-Fi, no nothing. Uh, but I'll go into the dynamic, dynamic bib assignment soon uh, in this video. Um, basically, what is, there's benefits of it. And I'll give you the highlights. Uh, you're going to not – and it's scary. So on my, on my screen here, let me pull up uh, the screen. So you'll see that there's no athletes in the race in the software. Let's imagine this art live stream 10K is a race that has 500 people pre-registered. You're going to show up on race day, assuming they don't have packet pickup early or whatever. Let's imagine that everyone's going to show up on race morning. And maybe that's not a good example of 500 people in uh, race morning only, but let's just go with that. You're going to show up on race day with the software looking just like this, where there's no participants in the software at all. Um, and what happens is John Doe shows up 
And let's say he's the first person to show up and he's pre-registered. So whenever he shows up, a volunteer is going to say, hey, have you pre-registered? Or you're going to have a sign up saying pre-registered over here, race their registration over there. And if he's pre-registered, he goes immediately to the check-in area. And there'll be at the check-in area, there's volunteers there with their phones that will say, hey, what's your name? And he says, oh, it's John Doe. Well, they type in either J-O-H or D-O-E or whatever it is, and it instantly pops up his name. They click on his name and say check-in. The check-in process says, okay, what's well, his bid number? Well, that volunteer reaches down and grabs the first bid number in the stack, or really any one of them, it doesn't matter, uh, hands it to him and types it in the phone and assigns it. At that moment, now this race that you see here is not linked to run sign up yet. We're going to do that in a second. But there'll be a sync button here. And next to the sync button, if it's race day, it automatically says only pull in those with bid numbers assigned. So even though 500 people are on run sign up, only one, John Doe, has a bid assigned. So when I sync uh, in the software, it only pulls in him. And the beauty of that is not only do you uh, – so because if you're if you're a timer that doesn't use dynamic bib assignment, you're probably in a position where you've got stacks of bibs of random numbers. Uh, because if you time a race, not everyone that registers shows up. And so maybe bib number two, number 12, number 82, and number 74 didn't show up at the last race. Well, now you've got these random bib numbers. Well, with dynamic bib assignment, you don't care. The volunteer simply reaches down and grabs whatever bib is there. And so you can use uh, any random bib numbers. You don't have to worry about sequential or not. Uh, you just have to make sure that no two people have the same bib number. Um, and the software only pulls in who actually showed up. And what's great about that is on the clock screen at the top, it'll tell you, hey, here's the total number of participants. And that will be an accurate number. It's who actually checked in that morning. And so this last thing here at the very top where it says the number of people on the course What's a much more accurate number if you're only pulling in those that truly showed up? Now, the, the software does have features where you can scan did not start tags and do other things to figure it out. Um, but the easier thing is to do dynamic bib assignment and, and only pull in those that actually showed up. We'll go into that in a little bit. But uh, that's Greg, that's a question that it's, it's a soapbox item. I'm, I'm looking forward to digging into it. So uh, next question, we are moving towards dynamic bib assignment. Can you go? Yeah, OK, yeah. So ultra or upset ultra. Yeah, we're going to dig into that. Uh, you will love it. Um, like I said, you'll never want to go back to the typical process of uh, John Doe walks up and you've got a roster printed with his bid number next to it. And you're like, oh, John Doe, 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 Doe. Okay, there you are. Your bid number 294. Then you start flipping through your stack trying to find 294. You're hoping that volunteer hands him the right number. It's just a nightmare. Uh, and I don't say nightmare. I don't be over dramatic here. I did it for years. It, you won't see it as a nightmare until you go to something that is – dramatically easier then you look back and say man that was that was error prone and there was you know it, it was you know i'm left with random bibs and it's hard to tell who actually showed up and who didn't yeah uh, so yeah uh we'll go into the dynamic bib assignment next so uh, not next but here soon uh muhammad again that i say they make sometimes intermediate checkpoints when they go to full speed I'm not talking about transition area uh they can reach around 60 Okay, yeah, so that's a good point. Um, I've never done – now, I have set up transition uh, – some sorry, split points on, um, for example, a marathon. I've not done like a split point for a cycling event or a triathlon that's a cycling leg. And so – but to, uh, to me, because um, I know that UHF, and I'm pretty sure passive – and I've actually got a video where uh, my next-door neighbor at my old house – He's a uh, he's not, he wasn't a professional motocross racer, but he was a motocross racer. And he we put like six tags on there, maybe five tags on the side of his bike, and we put them on the plastic components. But uh, we put six tags on, and it was all different tags. Some of them big, some of them small. And we were trying to test, well, how fast can this guy go by, and do we have a problem with any of the tags not reading? And he had that thing wide open. I mean, I think he was going you know well over 40 miles an hour. Uh, and I say wide open. His we were in a, a, a street that. Yeah, maybe a quarter mile long. And so he was he was flying by. Uh, never once did any of the tags get missed. And so I, if it was me, I don't have a concern about um, you know a passive uh, being picked up at that speed. Now, if this was like, um, in fact, I've got a video on my, on my website where a user, uh, a customer sent me. Uh, let me pull it up here. Now, uh, let me switch over to where. So a customer sent me this video. He said he had 100% uh, read rates. Um, 
Now he had four antennas overhead and two on each side, so eight total. Um, sorry, here's while this loads. Streaming in, trying to load another video, maybe. Yeah, I said he had 100% gear, and I've had like, people send me videos of other crazy events. Some of them are like uh, inline skating, but those guys are flying by also. Uh, never, you know, they said that 100% reads. Of course, they use multiple antennas and uh, you know, all that stuff. But, uh, so, yeah, we'll, we'll go on to the next question. Um, what is your backup if, they connect, if the connection you are going to use goes down and you were planning to use WNET? Okay, so. Well, that's one of the beauties, uh, Rod, with, uh, you know, today, where we are today, um, is that, you know, I've never needed to buy like a personal MiFi. I don't have to buy an extra. I've always had uh, no problems at all using simply my phone's hotspot. So I've never had to go buy a personal MiFi or some other extra data line. Um, and so let's say we do get this by And by the way, I use Google Fi. Uh, so that is, I'll type it here in the notes. Um, that's my phone carrier provider or whatever. Uh, and so they operate like off of Sprint and T-Mobile, whatever, towers. You know, obviously, if you've got like a Verizon or AT&T, it should be the same or better, uh, you know, when it comes to signal strength and, and coverage area. Uh, I've never had a problem. Now, again, I, I mentioned this last week. You don't want to find yourself in a spot where everything unravels because of one thing you depend on. And so if I found that my phone died, let's say I forgot my charger and my phone's dead and there's no – I can't provide a hotspot – Today, uh, every kid, every person, you know, has a phone, and nearly all of them can do a hotspot. Even if you went to somebody and said, "Hey, uh, my hotspot went down. Can you set one up?" And let's say they said, "Well, I can, but it's going to cost me money." I'll say, "Look, here's ten dollars, which is going to be probably five dollars more than I'm going to use, or here's twenty. I don't care what it is. Here's twenty dollars. You know, let me have a hotspot for an hour." And I've never need to do that. Uh, we do have volunteers that will operate um, the. Uh, the uh, paperless registration. So I have a volunteer that walks around that table with the computers and I, I simply, and every race has never been a problem. I'll say, Hey, can I get someone to monitor this station? If people have questions, you can get them through it. And of course I'll get them to register themselves first. Uh, and they simply don't check in. So they actually register for the race, but because they're never, they never receive a bid member. Then when I hit sync, it doesn't pull them in. So I get that volunteer to register themselves and that gets them comfortable with the process. And now that volunteer uh, I, I've never had someone say, no, I'm not going to do it. Or I can't do it where one of the volunteers that's working there simply does a hotspot and they're the ones that actually provide the internet for the registration area. Uh, so the same thing with the dynamic bib assignment, you know, you're going to have people there simply with their phones. So they don't, no one has to do a hotspot. It just simply works off the cell towers. Um, uh, so yeah, I hope that answers that question. Uh, if I, if I ever lost Wi-Fi, somebody there can provide Wi-Fi. So that's, that's, the beauty of where we are today is that everyone can do it. So, all right, uh, let's go on to leading up to a race. I think that tackles all those questions. Uh, let me, and then we'll highlight these so that we know they're tackled. Ooh, that's, that's, that color is bad. Um, okay. Um, all right, so we're, you've been hired to time a race. Um, so let me pull up the webcam again. Okay, so you have now been hired to time a race. Um, you've got all your, you've got your bug spray, uh, you got your towels, you got your tags ready, you got your safety pins. Um, you uh, you know they, they hired you in the races. Let's say two months away or a month away or whatever. So here's the questions that you need to ask as a race timer again to make sure you want to eliminate all variables as many as possible. Um, and so because again you are juggling a lot of stuff on race day. So here's the questions that you got to ask. Now, this is kind of obvious on the first one. You got to know the race name, the race date. Uh, you know, you got to know what distances. You don't, you don't, want, you don't want to show up and find out. Oh, this is actually a 10k and a 5k or whatever. And so, you want to know all the distances they're going to hold. Um, you're, you're going to want to even ask if they're having like a fun run or something. They don't plan for you to time because you don't want to be surprised by something that you didn't know. Like if if they only hired you to do the 10k and 5k, and they never told you because they didn't think you needed to know about it about a one mile fun fun run or whatever or a fun walk. Then, um, and that could cause problems. If you have extra people coming through your finish line that you weren't prepared for, you know, it's not a big deal except for your manual timing system. You know, it, it's hard for them to maybe know, okay, hey, does this person in the one mile or do they have the tag on the back, you know, or bib on the back? And so just be, you want to be aware of what else is going to happen. Uh, you want to ask early on what is, you know, a lot of races don't know, but, you know, hey, what's the total number of people you expect at this race? That way you can start preparing. 
Um, you want to know exactly where the race starts and where it finishes. Um, plus, you want to know which direction the runners are coming from. You know, keep in mind, you're going to be typically the first one there. And so I asked the race director, hey, is the, is when I show up, uh, is the finish line really easy to find? Have you put an F with a line somewhere or something? And maybe even an arrow saying, here's the way they're coming. Uh, because you don't want to set your finish line equipment up and find out, oh, they're coming the opposite direction. So you've got your banner facing the wrong way. And it's, you know, you don't want to be juggling stuff at the last minute. So where is the start? Where is the finish? Where is the nearest power supply if you don't have a generator uh, or a way to power everything? Um, you know, obviously got another race director's name, the email address, their phone number. Uh, that way, you know, if you show up at a race and you can't find the finish line or you need some help, if it's late at night, you know, sometimes I go the night before if it's far away or whatever or, or big race, uh, you know, you'll be able to contact them if you need to. So I'll get their info. Um, but the big questions are, what are, you know, what are the awards that are going to be given out? So you got to know, you know, are they doing master's awards? Are they, uh, how many per category? Uh, what are all age divisions are they giving out? Is it going to be, you know, male and female overall winners and how many prizes total? Um, because, you know, you can juggle all that stuff in my program, like at any point and reprint them, but you don't really want to be doing that. So, um, so you want to know, are they giving out team awards? Are they going to have any kind of like corporate team, uh, divisions or anything? Um, any special categories? Um, all right. And then this, this is a question that I don't think we've had to deal with in years, but I don't want you to have to deal with this because this can be, this can just stick a stake in your heart. There's been times where I've showed up at a race and, uh, yeah, they provided me a file with all the online registrants. Hey, great. I pull it in or whatever. Um, but then I show up at a race and then they hand me a stack of like 30 to 50 mail in registration forms. Well, that if you have to put all that in, that stinks. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. Why didn't you put these in on the online system and you know provide that in the file? I'm just saying you want to be prepared. You want to maybe ask, hey, are you going to have mail-in registrations? If so, how are you going to enter those? Uh, if they are not comfortable putting those in to their online registration provider, you can send them a Google Sheet, a Google Doc where where they can type it in and uh, you know you can share that with them. And you say, hey, please put them in here. And uh, I've actually got one I can pull up, uh, I think. As an example, uh, let me switch over here. So now years ago, uh, I created like different years. Uh, so like 2016, then here's all the races. And every side, every inside every race folder, I would say, you know, here's the race information. So like, you know, please uh, fill this out. So I would send this to the race director and ask her to fill out her info. Um, and then... Uh, if they had any mail-in registrations, I would send them this link and ask them to fill it out. And so here I could actually watch in real time as they fill it out. So if it's like a day before the race and I know that they told me they had like 50 to put in and I see they've got zero, I can say, hey, can you get on that or you know, hire someone or do whatever you got to do to get those in there. And that way I can simply download this um, as an Excel or CSV and import it in my system. So Google Sheets is great. I've even got, you know, an Excel document. If someone's not comfortable with this for some reason, you can send them an Excel document. This is the better way to go, though, because if you send them like an Excel document, what if they don't have Microsoft Excel uh, or Microsoft Office? And so uh, this is the best because you can actually check in on it anytime you want, download it anytime you want. You're not in a position where you're having to wait for them to email you a file. Um, so, yeah, uh, so that's one thing you just want to ask about is mailing registrations. Um all right, so next question or next thing you want to ask, uh, let me switch this back over. All right, next thing you want to ask is um, will they have race day registration? Some races don't. Some races, like the Sillimore 50K, 25K race, they sell out within five minutes this year was the time. Uh, and at that moment, it's capped, it's topped, and so nobody else can register. Uh, so there's some races where there is no race day registration, but if there is, you want to know where is it at and what time does it start. Um, Again, you, you have to you want to make sure that your finish line is mostly set up or all the way set up before registration starts. And so you need to know what time registration starts. Plus, if you're going to provide the computers for people to register, the race director is not going to be happy if it's registration time and you haven't set those out yet. So, um, so yeah, I want to know, will they have race site registration and what time does it start? Um, and then the next question is, do you need us to provide bibs or can we provide bibs for your race or do you have your own custom bibs? Uh, again, I mentioned that before. You can... I would recommend doing your own bibs. That's just what I do. Uh, 
primarily so that I can show up and know that, you know, the only thing I can't control is the actual course. If someone, if they don't have enough volunteers on the course or whatever, but when it comes to actually time in the race, when I show up, I want to know I've got everything you need to do a race. So you just send them out. And if you've done a good job, they'll come back. Uh, so yeah, I've got, I've got your bibs and everything. Um, if they use their own custom bibs, again, that's where you want to get those a week or two, preferably two weeks at least beforehand. So you can attach all the tags and whatever you got to do and ship them back to them. Uh, or you bring them, uh, for packet pickup the day before or the day of. Um, but I, I don't really, if I, if it's possible, I like to hold on to them and I bring them. Again, you don't want those getting lost in the mail the day before the race or whatever. I mean, it's just, you know, eliminate all those variables. So, uh, another question you want to ask before, race day is uh, will the race have early start participants um there's some races where let's say they got a handful of people that can't make the course cutoff time so they're going to start them early uh, and i can show you how to do that in the software it's easy to do uh, but you just want to know you don't want that to be a surprise uh the night before or the day of um and by the way all these things i'm talking about as you're asking these questions uh let me show you where to put them so whenever you um if you're like me you're juggling now, in the busy seasons, you've got like three or four races every weekend. And so we got different crews going different places. Uh, and so whenever we are, we go from week to week, right, where you may be getting emails about races a month in advance or whatever, about, hey, here's your hotel information. Uh, here's where our finish line's at. Here's where this is at. Um, you know, can you do this? You know, whatever. There's no way for me to remember all this stuff. And so what I did is I put into the software simply a timer's notes. So I can say, okay, hey, starts uh, at red gate behind a uh, barn or whatever. All right? And so I can put in like all my notes about the race here. And so now as I go from week to week, uh, I can pull up whatever the next race is, go to my notes and say, okay, do I have all the questions answered? You know, here's what time to start is, here's whatever. So this timer's notes is where you can start putting in all these questions I'm asking about. Now, some of these questions I'm asking or I'm bringing up here, um, you can look in the tips area. So I put this, even though I've been timing for a long time, I almost always review this this uh, quick tips. And I, if I review this and I know that I've covered, I've answered all the questions, I'm probably ready for the race. So I put this in as a reminder of all the things I got to make sure are squared away before I show up. So, I, you know, this is built into the program. This is where you type your notes in. Uh, so I just want to show you that. All right. So another question you want to ask besides, you know, will they have early start participants uh, is what about hotel information? Uh, what we do is basically if, if, if the race is far enough away to where we are required to show up, um, or sorry, if I have to leave my house earlier than like four o'clock in the morning, then preferably, and if the race can cover it, and often they can get a room comped for, uh, you know, as a don donation to the race, but we do ask for, you know, a hotel to be covered. Um, and so, uh, if they send me that hotel information, hey, here's where you're staying and here's what name it's under. And of course, I put that in the notes. But you want to know that information before race day. Um, and as we talked about before, you want to go ahead and ask the race director. They're familiar with the area. Hey, how's the cell signal? Or how's, you know, is there any Wi-Fi available? Um, and so that's a good time to ask that. And so that way you don't show up at a race ex assuming that you can do uh, the dynamic bib assignment and the paperless registration. And all of a sudden you can't. Now, by the way, if you ever do that, if you show up at a race and it's like, oh, crap, we have no cell coverage you know, I planned, I've got everything set up to do uh, dynamic bib assignment, but I can't. Uh, then, you know, one thing you can do is the software has it built into where you can print off registration forms. So you can just go to registration forms and it prints off a generic one. Uh, if you have a course map, it throws it on there and I just put some some basic notes in. It's got a very generic waiver, you know, where it puts the race name in and stuff like that. But So here's, you know, you can print off registration forms if you need to. Um so, and, and this is a case where if you're ever skeptical of, of the cell coverage, you could have a a, uh, a file of all the uh, participants. Um, that way, if you needed to manually import them, you could. Uh, so, anyways, uh, so you do want to ask about, you know, cell signal and Wi-Fi coverage. Obviously, if it's a big city, you don't have to ask about it. It's going to have it. Uh, but if you're timing in you know, Mountain View, Arkansas, that may be a problem. Uh, another question you want to ask um is who is their online registration provider? So a race, 99% of the time, they're going to be, you know, having online registration, you know, weeks before their event. So you need to know who who is that by. And can they grant your user account or can they give you access to that race? 
where maybe you can you know just pull down the participants anytime you want because again you don't want to be in a spot where you're having to wait on them to provide you a file of participants because what will happen is they get busy worrying about you know the water stations and you know, trophies and t-shirts and picking this up and getting volunteers and all this stuff they're doing and they will forget to send you the file or it's like when they send it to you it's like midnight the night before the race and so uh you want to ask who is their online register registration provider and if they can grant you access to it and i i, I I always feel uncomfortable saying this, and I'm probably going to get an email. Someone's not going to be happy. I'm going to say it anyways, but this is uh, what most race directors are happy to do is they simply give you their credentials. They'll say, oh, here's my username. Here's my password. You get in and get whatever you need. And because they know once they provide you access to the race or their credentials or whatever, then they can, you know, and I, you know, I tell them, so, hey, once, once I have access to the participants, you don't have to think about me anymore. Like, you know, uh, I can pull down whatever I need, whatever I want to. So we're good to go. Um, and so, yeah, most of them are happy to simply give you their credentials. Um, if it's a race that's on run sign up or race roster or race entry, or if it's a cross country a race, that's on TFERS, all of those interface with the software. You can pull them in by hitting the button. Uh, it's easy. If it's a race that's on uh, athletic.net or high tech, it, you know, it's in the high tech system. Those files can be pulled in real easy. Um, so yeah, it's, and, and if it's on a, any other online registration provider, there's a import feature here where you can pull in any kind of Excel or delimited file, um, and we can go over that in a second. Uh, but it's real easy to get the entries in. But you don't want to be in a spot where you're having to wait on the race director to send you those entries. All right, so we are now at a spot, <clears throat> again, where you just got hired to time a race. <clears throat> and so you need to create the race in the software. So uh, the... You know, obviously that's done here under create race. And so if it's a race and <clears throat> let's say that it's a race that's on run sign up and they granted your user account with access to the race, uh, then you can go in here or maybe. And again, I shouldn't say this. Run sign is probably cringing when I say this. Let's say they gave you, you know, their, you know, their credentials. You can plug it in here and it pulls up all the races assigned to that user. Um, but here, let me make this screen bigger. Uh and let's see. So we should have my art. So I've got the 5K here. So this will list any race that's under my account. <clears throat> and I can simply highlight it or multiple and pull them in. Um, so when I do that, it's pulling in. Hey, it, it says, do you want to use the bid members that uh, – oh, actually, sorry. I erased bid members on the 5K. I'm running sign up. So it's saying, what bid member are you going to start with? I'll go ahead and say start with one. And then it simply pulls the race in uh, with all the people. Um, so if it's on run sign up, race entry, race roster, it's super easy. And here's that sync button I told you about. Um, so, you know, we could say require bid number and then, uh, you know, it only pulls in those with a bid. So um, let's see here. Oh, so let's go back. And again, we're creating a race. Let's say it's not on one of those systems. Uh, then you can do create race and fill it out, you know, race name and all this stuff. I'm going to pull up the 10K because that's what I just did as I created it. Uh, have not mapped it up with, you know, run sign up or anywhere, uh, but I put in the race name, uh, you know, put in what type of race. You obviously, you got road race. You've got a road race with team scoring um, and then track or cross country race. So the difference between the two is that uh, if this is a track or cross country race, then uh, it doesn't bother to show you like the person's age or whatever. It simply shows their team and, uh, you know, it's, it's more geared to you know cross country and track and field compared to a, a road race with team scoring. Um, so that's, that's the three options there. Uh, then you can also decide if this race is determined by finishing time or most laps completed. Obviously most laps completed is, you know, a time-based race where it's like, Hey, we're going to run on the track for an hour and whoever does the most laps wins. Um, so the software handles that. Uh, now, by the way, if it's a race that's based on most laps completed, this distance is irrelevant. What it does is the software uses uh, a summation uh, for every athlete of how many laps they completed. So uh, here you can say, well, every lap is maybe 400 meters. Um, and this gap time represents when a tag comes by, how long do I ignore that tag before another read of that tag is determined to be a new lap? So if it's like a 50K and you've got like a, um, you know, let's say, but it's they're going to run 25K out, come back to the finish and run back out for 25K, then you know, it's very possible that a 25K participant decides to stop and drink a water, change their shoes, you know, get a snack or whatever, uh, and maybe they're there for 15 minutes before they head back out on the course. Well, if you know that it's physically impossible to someone for someone to run 
uh, 25K in less than two hours, you can set a gap time of like an hour or whatever. And that way, when that person comes back through, it knows, hey, ignore them because, you know, it's within the gap. So that's what that is. But um, so if your race is based on most laps completed, it does a summation of distance. Uh, otherwise, when the race is based on finishing time, the pace and the speed and everything is based on this distance um, here. So just be aware of that. Uh, here you've got the actual the date of the race. This is important to let the software know which races you might want access to in the clock screen. Obviously, you want to set the race date equal to the true race date. Um, um, but yeah, that's that's what that's for. Now, this actual start date time, this is set automatically when you start the race. Uh, I actually could set it. Um, let's just do, let's see, 8.13. So I can set it for sometime in the future. And you'll see that when I pull the clock screen up, it's actually doing a countdown. Uh, because I've set that start time as sometime in the future. Um, but so just be aware that when I start the race, um, or I could reset the race back to zero or it's no since I started. So uh, that's what this does. So you should really probably hardly ever touch this date time. Uh, in fact, again, that's question mark button. That's what, that's what this is. That, that'll tell you what that is. Uh, the race director info, uh, anytime you put in a city, state, zip, uh, sorry, zip code, uh, it'll automatically fill in the city and state for you. So just be aware of that. Uh, the software learns as it goes. So it's, you know, it's one of those things that once you type in, the very first time you type in a zip code, you have to type in the city and state. And then the next time you type it in, even if you got it wrong the first time, just fix it the next time, then it'll automatically use that newest entry. Um, the time zone, you don't have to set that unless you're going to push this up to run sign up. And even then, I'm not sure exactly what it does on their side, but it is available as a field of sync, so it's there. But let's get into the, uh, the meat of it here. So with the race, you want to ask, again, remember earlier I said about you want to ask about the different categories and awards. So in this example, I created a, a 10K race where they're going to give away maybe top five walkers get an award. And I was surprised to hear how uncommon it is for races to give away walking awards in other states and other areas. In Arkansas, it's, it's really common to have like, hey, we're going to have top 10 walkers receive an award. And obviously they have to walk. If you run any, then you're disqualified. You know, it's, it's an honor-based system. But, um, you know, there's, there's, there's people out there, they're competitive walkers and they'll title tell if they see someone sprint by them at the finish line. And so uh, so we have like, say, 10, top 10 walkers. And then, then obviously you got your runners um, that, you know, we we'll recognize maybe the top three male, top three female. Maybe we want to do the top three male masters, top three female masters. And then, then it goes to top three uh, grand masters, female, male, top three senior grand masters. And then after that, you get all your age divisions. Males either nine, females either nine, 10 to 14, and so on. So in this case, what I've done is I've distinguished two different types of athletes, walkers and runners. You can have wheelchair athletes. You can have whatever. If this was like a corporate challenge where maybe it's going to be like firefighters versus police officers versus something else, you can set those up as, as, as uh, you know, different categories here uh, or different athlete types. And then here's where you set the divisions up. So here, uh, let me expand this where you can see all of them. Um, you'll see that I've set up the, – the software wants you to set up the divisions kind of based on highest priority going down. And what I mean by that is, you know, the overall male runners are first. Now, it doesn't have to be male. It could be female or whatever. But the overall winners are first. And I've got three winners. Okay. And I set that the overall male running category only allows runners. Okay. Uh, and I said that the age is 0 to 120, basically everybody. Uh, and this is only for male. I could do a combined if they're going to give away not just male, not just female, but just top three overall. It doesn't matter what your gender is. You can do that. Um and there's no divisions higher than this. So there's nothing that can you know be filtered out before it gets to this point. So that's that's why it's blank. So then we got overall male uh, runner, overall male walker. So same thing, but you know, different athlete types. Overall female, same thing, just females uh, selected instead of male. Female walkers. Then we go to male masters. And what, what happens is the software sees, huh, you've got uh, a category above you that can allow the same type of people. So would you like to exclude them? So in this case, I'm going to say that male masters, uh, I'm going to exclude the overall overall male runners. But let's say if a walker, now this is not going to happen. But let's say a walker wins the whole thing. If they are a, a walker, I'm going to allow them to win the male masters, and I'm going to allow them to win the male walking uh, walking award. So that's what this is. This is saying, is there any division above me where those winners need to be excluded from this division? And so you'll see that as you create divisions, you can move stuff around by hitting the, the buttons here. Um, but this is how you can create them and move them around. So this division only allows 40 to 120. 
and then the next division is male grandmasters. And so with male grandmasters, what I'm saying is this division is everyone 50 and up. And so what the software does is, is huh, okay, well, there's a division above you um, that allows the same thing. Uh, and there's another one, male masters. So we're saying here that if someone wins the male masters, let's say they're 51 years old. Now, the, the master's division is 40 plus. So that includes 50 year olds, 60 year olds, and 70 year olds, and so on. And so what this is doing is that the grandmasters, even though it's 50 plus, if if I'm 51 years old and I win the entire race, don't uh, allow me to be the winner of this one. Now, if your race wants that, if they want to be listed as a winner of, of overall and masters, you can simply uncheck it and say, okay, yeah, allow them to win both. Um, so I hope you're getting the concept here. This is how this is set up. So really, it's the same way all the way down. So you got your female, you know, and male grandmasters, senior grandmasters. And then you got your age divisions. Where for the age divisions, that's the same thing. I'm gonna say female 15 to 19. Yeah, if you're a female and you win the whole thing, uh, most races don't double dip on the awards. And the reason why is because if I'm if I'm a winner of the race, I'm not gonna go brag to my friend and post on Facebook, hey, look at my male 30 to 39 award or whatever division I'm in. I'm gonna brag and say, hey, look at my overall award. So that that age division trophy. Even though technically they did win that, if you like, want to be legalistic about it, uh, they won that division truly. But most races don't give that award to them because it's a wasted award. Uh, um, again, that's some people may argue against that, but that's the way most races do it, I believe. So that's that's why this software is set up to do that. So, um, so yeah, uh, that's how divisions are set up. So your lowest division here, 70 plus, it's got a lot of exclusions. Um, so yeah. All right. Uh, let's see what else. Um, now here you can set up, you know, some races use age based on a certain date, like, you know, December 31st of that year. You can, you can change how the, uh, divisions are calculated here. Um, one thing that's cool, by the way, is when you set up all your divisions, this is a very common thing, uh, that the race director will realize they made a mistake or they, uh, didn't give you their, uh, maybe they decided to change divisions at the last minute. Uh, you can actually enter all your stuff based on what the because you know here's the thing with divisions it's easy for things to get lost in translation because what if the race director tells you hey I'm giving away top three overall male and female okay well you might take that as one through three male one through three female then you show up at the race and then she says no I said top three male and female like okay well I didn't know that you meant top three combined you know like if a female wins or gets second overall that's you know, that's of the three overall trophies, she gets second place. Um, you know, there, there's, there can be some problems there. And so what I've done is I've added a feature where you can, uh, now if I click this button, it's going to automatically, in fact, let me go ahead and do it. Uh, if I click that button, it's going to email me the whole race setup. So it says this race information is sent to the race director for verification. Now, if I pull up my email, uh, okay, so here's what I got. So, so I, I received this email. Basically, imagine this is going to your race director. It says, thank you for giving this opportunity to time your race uh, to ensure accurate results are provided. And you can read all, all it says here. It basically lists everything that was set up. You know, here's your giveaway items. Um, here's your, you know, if it's cross country, here's your members and displacers. Here's your distance. You know, here's the race date. Uh, here's your type of athletes. Here's your divisions. And so basically it says, you know, hey, here's for your review how I set your race up. Um, now, if you wanted a preview of... Uh, of what's going to be sent, you can hit this little magnifying box here and it pulls up that same thing. Uh, if you like what it says, then, um, and by the way, of course, with all my reports, you hit the design button if you want to change anything about it. So, um, but this is the email that gets sent out to everybody. So another cool feature, I don't know if anybody else has that, but, um, and, you know, this software, I've tried to do everything I could to add anything that could prevent any kind of disasters. Um, so that's a helpful tool. Okay, um, the next thing on this screen and this is the screen I'm going to spend a lot of time on just because of all the things you can do. But typically when I set this race up, it's not fun to go through the process of setting all this up. Now, by the way, it is easy. Uh, I'll show you in the, in the 5K. Uh, it's easy to set this up, but to have to go and do the exact same thing on another race, um, usually what you do is I set up the race like I went perfectly, got everything where I know it's right, and I'll simply say duplicate race. And when I do that, it'll simply create – in fact, let me go and do it. So it says race copied. Uh, so when I do that, there should be a 10K copy right here, and it's got everything set up exactly the way we've got it on the other one. So uh, let me go ahead and delete this one since we don't need it. Okay, so we are now back on this screen. Let me show you the last few things you may want to know about on this. Um, 
on the screen. So if you do have a, a team race, here's where you can set up your teams. Uh, if, if you, you know, obviously, uh, as a race timer, you typically time in the same region all the time. So you may have the same teams if you're timing like cross country. So you can click this little button here. You may have a, you know, list of teams. You can click on the columns to sort it. You can start checking your teams off and pull them in. Uh, or of course you hit the plus button and add them. Uh, let's say this is an unattached, uh, entry and I can say exclude this team from the results. Um, uh, I don't know how you, uh, abbreviate unattached, but anyways, um, so that's how you can create teams. Uh, here again is where you set up your split division. So if this race is going to have, let's say you're going to track, you know, uh, about four splits on this particular timing station, you can set those up and you can say, well, this is, um, let's say quarter marathon or I'll just call it quarter split. And let's say I'm just, I want a distance, uh, 5,000 meters. Um, apply that to all of them. And so I can call that the quarter. I can call this, you know, half and so on. So that's where you can set up your splits. You simply change the number and automatically changes, um, you know, the number of splits available. Um, so that's how that works. Um, and then uh, when there's only one, the description is irrelevant. It doesn't use it anywhere. Um, so then you, here you can set up giveaways. Now, by default, there's a link here. If you don't have anything that says add typical shirt sizes, and it automatically adds these items in. Uh, but, of course, if you're going to give away different items, let's say, you know, a uh, red hat, uh, then you can add that in. Um, so that's where you add your giveaway items. Now, by the way, one thing that's cool is if you've, if you've got the race linked up with, with Run Sign Up, and I hope the other – Online reg registration providers add this to the APIs also. When you set your divisions up uh, and, of course, your giveaway items, stuff like that, they automatically come over from Run Sign Up uh, or it'll get pushed up to Run Sign Up. Now, Run Sign Up doesn't track those exactly the same, so it's pretty close on what you get from Run Sign Up. But if the race director did set up divisions there, then you don't have to worry about you know, setting everything up from scratch. Uh, so if they are a Run Sign Up, then you want to tell them, hey, go ahead and set up uh, your divisions if, if at all possible there. That way, again, you don't have things lost in translation when you're trying to read the email on how things should be set up. Um, the final feature I'll show you on this screen uh, is the course map. And so here, I don't know if any other system does this, but you like, let's say that I'm sitting down with you, a race director, and we're, we're trying to decide, hey, let's have a race. Uh, where can we do it and whatever else? And, you, and you know, I might say, okay, I know of a good course at a Craighead Forest Park. And I can say, well, let's just, you know, plot it out. So I can create a course. And it, by default, uh, with this next update, it's going to use this website here, uh, plotterroute.com. But let's say you already had a course on, like, Map My Run or whatever. You can simply change it. So uh, mapmyrun.com. Um, and now I don't have a login to it, so I don't know. You know I'm just going to go back to what was there. But uh, this should pull up whatever website you want. Um Again, Matt, my run, I haven't used it in forever. I don't even know if it's still up anymore. So I'm going to go and click on Create Course and go back to the original site. Start a new route, yes. All right, so uh, here's start a map. Um, basically, the way this works, let me type in Craighead Forge Road. We'll do that, sure. So let's just say... I want to follow by road. I'm going to say I'm going to start over here, and then I'm going to plot a course around Craighead Forest Lake. And here, and we'll say we finish over here. All right, so 3.11, pretty close. Um, and I can... Zoom out just a little bit here somewhere. I'm not going to, uh, I think it's right there. Uh, so I can get this in or out however I want. I can say finish mapping. And then I can get just that course. Maybe I want to get the street names up here too. Uh, zoom that in a little bit. <clears throat> and then I can save this uh, and give it, let's say, option two. Um, and so now that's another course that I've got mapped. Um, so yeah, so the software allows you to map courses, and I can even pull it in from a file. So I pulled this one in from a file, for example. Uh, I don't know what all of these are. Let's pull in an image. Um, uh, I don't know what I clicked on. Anyways, if I had uh, a course map, it would uh, pull it in there. So that's how that works. You can add um, multiple course maps. So I, again, I don't know if any other program does that, but that's another cool thing.
All right, so that's it for this screen. So that now you've got the race set up. The only thing else uh, is your web interface options. If you want to, so here's here's the cool thing. Usually, what I do is, is uh, I will create the race in the program and then push it up to run sign up. And uh, now you can also go to run sign up and and you know. Uh, uh, create it there and then pull it down. So there's no matter which way you go about it. Let's say you get hired time of race and it's already on run sign up. You could create it in the program and then link it. You can say, okay, hey, uh, so I've got it set as a team ra a race and I haven't put any, uh, scores or anything. So I'm going to say, go ahead and ignore that and continue. Um, so I could push it up to run sign up or link to a race already on there by hitting this link button and I can simply select whatever race I'm link it to or I can push it to run sign up. And it says, hey, oh, it's, let me let me switch that off of uh, team. So here, if I push it to run sign up, it'll look to see what are the races I've got going on that day. And I'll say, huh, is this race you're trying to push up the same uh, part of a series as this other one you've already got to run sign up? And if I hit yes, then they'll both share the same URL. And it'll make this race as another ver a race that people can register for on the same website. So it's really nice. Um, I'm going to go and hit no. And if I hit no, then I can give it whatever URL I want. Um, and so when I enter that, hit, hit OK. Now that race is on run setup and it's active. Now it's, it can't take registrations until you actually put in the payment information, but it is active. It's there. Uh, and now you can send that to the race director to put in their bank info. Um, so I like creating it here because again, it'll push up all the divisions you set up and everything, uh, that you've got set up here. Um, so yeah. So let's look at, uh, let's go ahead and push this up to run sign up so that it's there. I'm going to say yes. So now it says, hey, this is now available on Run Sign Up. And you see how it gave you that URL that has the 5K as well. Uh, so I'm going to say save. So now I should have a 5K and a 10K. Um, so we've got the event on Run Sign Up. I think this one, yeah, this one's already mapped up. Um, so let me go ahead and delete all these, all these athletes from this one. And let's let's imagine that you've got the races on Run Sign Up, but they were using a different platform. And so you need to push the athletes from, let's say, races online or some other active.com or whatever. You want to download the, the, the participants from Excel or, or Excel or whatever, and then you want to push them up to run sign up so you can do the paperless registration and the dynamic dynamic on summit. So uh, let's say for this 10K, I'm going to import a file that I was received that I received from the race, and I've got one here that says 10K participants. Uh, now, by the way, I've shuffled all the ages. I got rid of all the email addresses. Uh, someone pointed out last week that, that you know, I shared um, email addresses. And so uh, I, I took all that out. Um, so here you can put in whatever delimiter, um, if it's a pipe or whatever. Most of them are going to be comma separated. It says, hey, is the first row a column header? If you're not sure, go ahead and hit yes, and you can repull it in if, it, if it's not. Uh, but the software will map it all together. It will allow you to drag and drop columns. Now, this one was already pre-formatted to go in just for the speed of this video. Um, if, if it didn't have bib numbers, the software, when you import, will say, hey, uh, what bib, bib number are you going to start with? Uh, I'm going to go and go ahead and use these. Um, in fact, no, I, I'll tell you what, let's start with, let's start with, uh, drag a blank column over there. Um, so let's start with nothing. Uh, and then let's just pull this in. Uh, let's see, placeholder. Okay, I think everything's in the right spot. Yeah, so I got rid of data burst and everything. Uh, so I'm going to pull this in, and I'm going to start with bib number 300. All right, so 137 people just pulled in. So now I've got these people pulled in. They were from Active or some other website, but they're not on Run Sign Up. However, I want to use Run Sign Up's tools for the dynamic bib assignment and for the uh, paperless registration. Now, of course, these people simply go straight to check in, so they're only going to be used for the dynamic bib assignment. But I will show you the paperless registration uh, aspect here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and say sync. And what's happening is it says, okay, I'm going to check run sign up to see if there's anybody pulled down. And uh, if there's not, and it sees that you've made changes in the, in the program, uh, then it says, would you like to update the list on run sign up? And I'm going to say yes, which now pushes all these people up to run sign up. So you see it's adding them here. So we'll let that work. Now, by the way, while this is working, if you're timing a if you're timing a cross country race and you're having to get registrations from different coaches all around, again, that's a good time to set up a Google Doc. So maybe send that uh, to the coaches, um, and and you may have to do a separate one for every coach if you're not you know if you didn't want other coaches seeing 
you know, the athletes from other teams for some reason. But, you know, then you can actually monitor as they're putting stuff in and pull it down wherever you want. Um, and then you can pull all the, all the information in. All right, so now all those people are run sign up. So what I'm going to do now is now that they're on run sign up, I can turn around and delete them from here. Um, and so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to run sign up if I want to use the paperless registration. And let me pull up the right page here. Uh, so let me just go. And I'll show you how to set it up. Uh, another aspect of this. Let me go here, my races. So we've got the our live stream 10K, and I'm going to go to race. I think it's actually Free State Tools bibs, and then this is assign bibs and tags, and I'm going to clear assign bib members and chips, and I'm going to say from the 10K. Because what happened is you know bib member 300, 301, 302, and so on was pushed up to run sign up, and so now we've got all the participants uh, on run sign up. And uh, they are not in my software in either race. And so F let me get rid of these. Okay, now if I hit sync, um, with that required bib number on, you'll see that it pulls everybody in. Okay, and it, it, because there's no bib numbers on runtime, it says, what are you going to start with? Okay, so now, now it's actually pulling for both races, so let me get rid of that. Um, all right, so delete them again. Just I just want you to see that they are all there. And delete. Now, if I do require a bib number and then hit sync, it won't pull anybody in because there's no bib numbers assigned to either one of the races. Um, so on race day, you will have people, and I'm going to go ahead and pull up the uh, – the webcam so you can see my phone here. So I'm going to pull up my phone. Um, I'm going to go to the race day check-in app. And my phone is slow as Christmas right now. So, All right, so it's coming up. Come on. Phone's on its last leg. Probably see it's cracking the screen. And one of the races, it should float up near the top. Uh, if not, you can start searching for it. Let me just type in session because I know that's in part of the file name. Come on, my races. Call it. All right, there it is. All right, so you select the race, it pulls it up, and then it automatically goes to all the list of athletes. Okay, so you can scroll through them or you can start typing in a name. So if I type in, let's say uh, you can't see it because of glare, but let's say Kim. So to pull up anybody where Kim is part of the first or last name, you can simply select somebody, uh, select somebody, and it'll say check in. Let's see if I could do this backwards. And then it'll say what's their bid member. And so let's say I do uh, two, whatever. Oh, I just did two. So let's do two. Uh, so now that person is checked in. Now, one of the things I do is I go ahead and enable the options to change any giveaways. I can change their events. I can edit the pers personal information. So if I look and I see, wait a minute, I've got Kim as a male, then I can actually change it here. So when people go to the check-in area, I train the volunteers and say, hey, when you check them in, kind of glance down at the info. And if it needs to be changed, you can do it. And so the beauty of this is you as a timer, that check-in area, you want to get those people to where they can handle everything. If someone says, I want to swap events, I'll oh, go to check-in. They can do it. Oh, uh, I saw when I did the tag check or when they checked me in that I'm you know, the wrong gender. Maybe I registered so fast I didn't pay attention and I got the wrong gender or my age is wrong or whatever. Or let's say that someone says, hey, my friend registered and the race director is allowing me to take their place or something. Well, they can go – to edit personal info and change all this stuff uh, as necessary. So you as a timer, you're not having to deal with all that mess. And that's where the beauty of uh, moving away from the paper registration and uh, flipping through the bibs, trying to find the one, you know, based on what was pre-assigned. Uh, so it's a really nice – and Race Entry, by the way, I think has a similar a nice check-in app. But Run Sign Up is, is you know, uh, pretty far ahead of just about everybody else when it comes to um, all the features of the API and, and the check-in app. So um, – yeah, I mean, I'm encouraging the other platforms, even though I love Run Sign Up, to say, hey, you know, there's there's got to be some some stronger competition here because they're running away with it. But um, so that's why no matter what platform a race is using, I always 
until, you know, until, unless there's, you know, there's some like a race roster has got a good platform, but, you know, their check-in process right now is not mobile friendly. You have to use a computer, which means that's extra computers they have to worry about, whereas everyone's got a phone. And so, um, anyways, so I, I pushed everything, no matter where it came from, to run sign up. And I pushed all the athletes to run sign up. I cleared the bid members, and now I can use the dynamic stuff. Um, so, yeah, so that's that process. And now let's go back to the computer. Now that you see I've assigned one bid member, and I even know what race that was for, uh, the 5K. So if I go back to the computer, and now I've got require bid number, and if I hit sync, it will pull in uh, zero for the 10K. And it should pull in, yeah, one new entry for the 5K. And it says, hey, do you want to use the bid numbers that are on run sign up? Because earlier it said, hey, we don't have bid numbers. What are you going to start with? And it you know, allowed me to type a number in. Now it says, hey, we see bid numbers on run sign up. Do you want to use those? And I hit yes. Okay. So now it says one new athlete added. If I go to the 5K, there it is. And another, another beauty of the interface with run sign up is if I swap their race in the software, which I can do here, it will automatically swap them on run sign up. Or if I swap them on Run Sign Up with the the uh, check in app um, with the phone, and I hit sync in the software, uh, it'll automatically sw swap them in the software too. So again, they can do everything, and you can just hit sync. And usually, what I do is while they're checking in, and maybe I'm working on the finish line, I'm making sure things are going well over here. I might walk over to my computer, and I just hit sync, and I just do that maybe every every ten minutes, every whenever. That way, if if some catastrophe like uh, whoever pointed that Greg or somebody. Um, is what if the whole world's internet goes down or all seven, you know, whatever. Yeah, at least I've got data every now and then. So that's not going to happen. But still, I, I usually go and hit sync every few minutes. Uh, but I'm I'm really comfortable. I've done it so long to just go and hit sync right before the race starts or even after the race starts. I can hit sync. And what's nice with this, by the way, is if you do have check-in or sorry, split stations out on the course or um, if you've got maybe a, a chip start that's a mile away or whatever or you, you've got multiple computers on your finish line, you're not having to juggle – uh, databases or whatever on all those computers you just say hit sync and it pulls everything in gets it all right based on what's online so basically what you're doing is you're using run sign up as your master database of athletes and you're simply pulling them into the software at the last minute so that's the difference compared to uh, the way uh, you used to be able to do it so Whew, okay um, let's see what questions day of registrations I usually get 100 walk-ups again that's the nice thing uh, let me show you what the website looks like. So what I do is I set up at least four computers, you know, two of them back to back so that with a table. So that, you know, chair here, chair here, computer back to back. And that way people can sit there and I have a person, you know, kind of walking around in case people need help. Uh, but I, I set up at least four. Obviously, obviously, if it's a bigger race, you can ask for more. Um, you know, if it's a bigger race and you don't have that many computers, ask the race director to say, hey, do you or your committee members, race committee members, can y'all bring extra laptops, tablets, or whatever? Just anything that has a browser window on it. And then you can send them uh, this link right here. I'll pull it up for you. Um, so this link right here. So uh, in fact, I've got it saved in my bookmarks. Uh, there it is. It's uh, run, yeah, race day sign up. So this link, you send them to that. And you can tell them, hey, when you when you go there, click on the search bar at the top and type in, uh, let's do art. Uh, yeah, there is live stream session. Click on it. Uh, now, when they click on it, it may ask them to put in a password. And I'll show you where you can set that up. And you can tell them that password. Say, when you click on it, put in the password. Um, and then simply do enter registration. At that moment, you set laptops up with this screen and that's it. And they're ready to go. Um, so if you have 100 people that walk up and want to register, uh, obviously you may want to have six to eight laptops or whatever, um, and they, you know, they're just ready to go. So people come in here. Let's just register myself. Uh, run, AG, uh, three. Oops, I didn't realize I didn't do the year. Um, mail. Continue. All right, there's only uh, one option. I may not – oh, I didn't enable registration for the 10K, uh, so it's only showing the 5K right now. I just pushed the 10K up just a second ago. Um, so anyways, I'm going to go ahead and say 5K. I'm going to sign the waiver. Uh, hit continue. I'm going to pick uh, – let's do adult large. And then runner walker. Now, by the way, they do have a, like an expo mode and a kiosk mode. Um and they, I think they recommend that you use that, but I, I, I tried it or I looked into it. And then one reason why I didn't is because this next option here. Um, I don't think that those kiosk or expo mode 
not I mean, I think they they have a way to do it, but it's kind of it seems not as clean as this. There wasn't a way to simply say pay by cash, um, because a lot of people they 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 walk up with a check because they're, you know they're still not used to races being able to take credit cards and different things, and so a lot of people have cash or check, and so. Uh, I like the way this website works, uh, where they just simply do pay by cash and then hit continue. And so now I'm in the race. And then, you know, I think after a while, it'll automatically go back to the, the next screen. But otherwise, you can train the volunteer to click on this button or to do start over. Uh, I don't think, I don't know if start over does the same thing. Maybe, surely it doesn't unregister the person. But anyways, uh, so register for the next person. And now this is ready to go. Um, so again, back on the check-in app, if I wanted to, uh, now I should be able to search my name and I cannot do this backwards. So let's just have to trust me. So yeah, type in AG and there I am, uh, uh, check in and then let's just whatever bid number I can get. All right. So now I'm checked in. So that's that's it. So yeah, that's that's the process. Is I'll set up laptops with the website ready to go, and I can set that website up ready to go the night before the race. I don't have to try to pull up the race morning. So I simply open the lid, turn the computer on, and it's boom, ready to go. Of course, I got to have internet access, right? Uh, and then so here's my flow on on race day. People show up, and someone asks, or you have signs simply pointing people, hey, registration's over here. After you register, you go to check in. If you've already pre-registered, go straight to check-in. So when you register, uh, all bibs are passed out at the check-in area. Now there is the option to assign bib number at check at the registration area. I find it easiest just to have one spot where all bibs are handed out, handed out. And so uh, that that's what I do. So again, you're not having to. Here's the problem for paper registrations. Number one, half the time you can't read them. Uh, because, you know, it's, it seems like everybody's a doctor when it comes to race morning because you can't read the handwriting. Uh, and then, of course, half the people leave half the fields blank. And by the time you realize that, OK, hey, I can't fill this paper out because it's missing or I can't read it, that person's gone. Uh, or at the top of the registration form, maybe they didn't, uh, you know, type in a bid number. So in fact, let me pull it up here. So if you'll see that the way I recommend it, if you are going to do paper registration uh, in the top right corner or somewhere, um, you know, write in the bid number. So uh, that way, when you, if you're putting in paper registrations, uh, you know, you, you can actually read the information, hopefully write the bid number in and you got everything you need. But all right. So I hope I didn't forget anything. Let me read through the questions. Um, weird question. I direct ultra races where I give runners the option to drop down the distance during the event. If, uh, if it's multiple loops, can you explain some changes in time? Discrepancy. Uh, so um, what happens here is let's say I'm timing the race and someone comes up uh, and let's just say both races start at the same time uh, and bib number two just finished the race and told me, oh, man, I didn't feel good. Uh, I was well, I felt great. I ran the lap twice and uh, I did a 10K instead of 5K or something crazy. Right. You can double click here and swap them. You can double click here. You know, sometimes it's easier to find them by name or by bid number. Bib number. Or if you know before the race starts, uh, you can also swap them back on this other page here. So I can just swap them there. So either way, uh, in the time, if, if the race has started at different times, the software automatically readjusts and does everything. Uh, or actually, if it started at a different time, the software will show you, hey, which race did this person start with? So let's just do that real quick. Uh, time race. Uh, let's start. Okay, so the 5K has already started, or 10K has, because I only. Let's just start from the beginning. So, if I want to start just one race, let's say the 10K starts first, I'm going to hit the space bar. Okay. Now, typically, I don't bring my computer to the starting line, I bring a stopwatch. And what happens is I will uh, start the watch uh, when the race starts, walk over to my finish line computer, and then sync it up. And I'll say, okay, well, my watch is at five minutes or six minutes and. You know, 24 seconds and then I get it to where these are in sync and then hit save and so now that 10k is that you know matches my stopwatch and then when the 5k starts you know I clear my stopwatch and I'll go back and say okay on your mark get set go and I start it and that way I'm not having to bring the computer over or whatever um, so now I've got two different clocks going you see here and so let's say that the person comes across um, and they just finish you may hear my camera clicking and then they come and tell me, uh, oh, well, I ran the opposite race. 
let me just do it from let's do it from this screen. Um, so yeah, bib number two actually ran the 10k. So what happens is the software says, okay, wait a minute, these uh, first of all, this person is swapping to a different race. Would you like to swap the bib number and run sign up too? I go yes. And then it, now it sees, okay, well, there's a difference between when these races started. And so it's if you hit no, this will keep that time of 11 seconds. If you hit yes, that you wanted to adjust the time, which means, yeah, they actually, yeah, not only did I have them in the wrong race, but they started in the other race, right? Um, so then, yes, adjust their time to the 646. Um, so, yeah, just, you know, you can read there and it'll, it'll do the adjustment. I hope that answers the question. Uh, dumb question. Can you set the same age group standard for all your races? Um, so if you had the same age group for all your races from here to eternity, um, then or whatever, or for the majority of them, you could simply pull up any race, duplicate it, and then change the name of the race and change the date and whatever else, you know, distance, or whatever you need to. That way you don't have to re-enter all this. Let me go ahead and show you how easy this is to enter, though, uh, because it's not that hard. So let's just say it's a new race and you're going to set up divisions. Let's say you're not doing walkers, so I'm going to get rid of those, um, and I, I can go ahead and get rid of this here. Um, and I'm going to do, uh, let's say it's a very small race, and so we're going to do like um, zero to nine. We're going to do ten year gaps, and so I'm going to say include. I'll create female divisions also, and I'm going to do three winners for each, each one of them. So I'm going to say save, 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 save. Now what it what it's doing is of course it's you know, I said create the female division also, and whatever, uh, it increments a year, but also it leaves the exclusions on. So I can just keep hitting save, uh, and then now I'm going to say 60 plus. Oops. Sixty plus. Save. And then go to females because it just put their age range in, say 60 plus. All right. And so let's say later, though, you decide, oh, shoot, I need to add masters in. We'll add masters. So let's say it's 40 plus. Let's say they're not going to do senior grandmasters or whatever. It's just, just masters. And I'm going to say male. Um, and then I'm going to save. So now these are at the bottom. And I'm going to call this male master. Masters. Female masters. I probably should have moved them before I did this, but we'll go do this. Masters. All right, and now I want these higher than the other divisions, and I'll show you why. All right, so now those are there. Uh, whoop, one more. And I need to go ahead and say, well, if they win the Masters division, I don't want them to win their age division because, you know, maybe that's more prestigious. Um, so now I can add those exclusions in. So that's how you set your divisions up. It's not hard. Um, but if you wanted to save time uh, and your, your divisions were always the same, then you could do that. Um, yeah, so that's how that's done. I'm going to close that out. Okay. Um, when you have someone come up to pick up a, to get a bib, can you have it uh, so it pops up to tell you uh, if they get a shirt or other special item? Well, it is part of the check-in process um, where you can see the giveaways, uh, but it doesn't like have some kind of you know, pop-up that I'm aware of. You know, that would be a run sign-up thing. If, if, uh, let me pull up the app here so you can see it and let's turn this on so yeah whenever i pull up my name you see it's got adult large giveaway um but there's not like a, a big pop-up that i'm aware of that, that you can do now if you're asking if the software does that no the software doesn't um the software does have features in there we can put in like a special note so that when a person finishes on the tv it'll show their name their time and then whatever special note like happy birthday or whatever um but yeah it doesn't have any kind of i hey, stop you in your tracks pop-up all right. Um, all right. Well, we'll fly through the rest of this. Now, one thing we haven't done is uh, actually showed you how to once you've got the race on run sign up. Because uh, let's say that yeah, I pushed that 10k up, uh, but I did not. Let's see if I can find. Okay. So let me show you how to set the race up once it's on run sign up to allow paperless registration and to allow the check-in process. Uh, so let me switch back over to here. And all this, by the way, is on a users group um, um, page where it's got a step-by-step -step guide and how to set this stuff up. Um, so I'm going to go to the race. Let's see, where is the race page? Let me just go. Let's go here. So when you push a race from the software up to run sign up, you'll see it here. Um, and I'll do it for this race, the Soul for Souls 5K. Um, so first thing you do is you'll go to race and make sure that you've got a registration period that's that's going to cover 
the, the day of the race. Because you know, in order to do the paperless registration with computers there, even if you know, I think even if you're using kiosk mode or whatever, and I may be wrong on that. I know that the, the app that I use, the, the sign-up app, you have to have a registration period. And so let's say the race is today. Now, what I do is don't make the registration period end when the race starts because with it being so easy for you as a timer – if someone, let's say that someone walks up 10 minutes after the race starts and says, oh, I got lost getting here. Can I still register and run? Well, that race, they don't want to lose that money. And uh, for you as the timer, all you got to do is hit sync after they register or after they check in. So it's no burden to you uh, for them to do it. So if this race is uh, going on, let's say today, um, then I'm going to set this date here. And let's say the race is at uh, 8 a.m., then I might go ahead and let's say I know I'm going to leave the race by, by noon. I might set it to 12 p.m. And that way registration is open the whole time I'm there. If anyone shows up or let's say someone shows up and says, I just want to make a donation to the race. Oh, you can go register for the race as, you know, as a donation uh, you know, over there at the registration area. So I like to keep registration open. Uh, so you do have to set up a registration period. Now, when you do that, you also have to uh, set up uh, you know, the payment account. So in the past, and again, this is where run sign up is probably going to cringe. I would set it up to where it went to my payment account because I didn't want to bother the race director if they're using like active or some other place to go set their bank information up somewhere else. So I would simply have the funds go into my account and then I would write a check. And of course, I would provide all kinds of documentation uh, to, you know, to make sure they know that there's, you know, I'm not hiding anything anywhere. And so I don't like to touch money at all. In fact, even when I'm on, um, it was in the past doing paper registration, I'll tell them, Hey, your volunteers touch the money. I just put people in. And so, however, I try to make things easy for them and I'd set everything up for the paperless and I would provide them a document and I would say, Hey, you know, I could either write you a check or you can take this out of the money that you owe me for, for timing. Uh, but with the whole tax thing going on now, I would not recommend that. And that, that's probably, something that runs on up wouldn't recommend anyway, just because, you know, what if there are bad characters out there that would have the money go into their account and, and uh, you know, just try to steal it. But, um, you know, obviously if this was a really large race. I would not do that, but you know, we're talking about very small mom and pop, you know, hundred people races, 200 people races. Uh, so we're not talking about like, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a year. So, um, so one thing you do have to do if they are going to have paperless registration is you do need to get them to set up their bank information uh, either where, where to mail the check or a direct transfer of the funds or stuff like that. Um, so that's the one thing that is a little bit of a headache for you because, you know, you have to rely on somebody else for it. Everything else you can do yourself. So set up a registration period that covers the race. Get the race to put in the, the payment information, the bank information, um, so that, you know, they can receive the funds directly. Uh, of course, you can you can paint that, as, you know, show that as a positive thing. Hey, we want to, you know, the funds are going to go directly to the bank account, whatever. Um and then the next thing is you want to go to uh, race day registration, sign up app, and I'm going to go ahead and leave this page. And here uh, looks like uh, they've already got one set up. And in fact, I sh let me go ahead and go back. I didn't know that was already set up here. So let me go to a different race, the 10K one. I don't get too far into one race and show too much there. So, uh, Race day tools, race day registration, sign up app. So here I set it up to where I set the password up as session two. Um, and so now if we pull up this website, when it asks for a password to get to this screen, they, they type in whatever you, what you, what you, what you type, type in here. Now I put, I always put the password in as the hint because I don't want to set it up and then forget it, right? And then we're totally, you know, if I totally forgot it and I don't have no clue what it is, I don't want to be up a creek. And so. I set the password up. It has to be, you know, at least one number and, you know, one uppercase letter and then whatever else, and maybe eight digits or whatever, or characters. Um, so once you set this up, then you're good to go. And I think I do go ahead and, and set up the uh, defaults, which is, uh, you know, allow people to pay with cash. <clears throat> you can make it to where if uh, they're required to put a password in. So that if someone, if you're worried about the race that is like going to just check that option to pay for cash and then go run your race and ne they never really paid, well, then your volunteer can can be forced to type in a password to prove, yes, they actually paid with cash. Uh, so that's what that is. I do have it to where the, the sign-up process, I want it to be as fast as possible. So I disable just about everything except for the core stuff I need as a timer. So I, I want the gender, I want the date of birth, but I don't care about their address. Um, I would like to get the email address, but I don't want to be in a spot where me as a timer – 
um, you know, I'm, I'm busy that morning. Uh, and it would be nice to get the email address so I can send them individualized results. But I'm not going to force the, the participant to, to put one in if they don't want to. Because uh, some pe- some people, especially you know, those arts of, of Arkansas here, they just don't have an email address. Um, so I don't want to hold up registration for that reason. So I, I do allow them to skip it. And then I skip all these fields. Um, I don't think there's anything. I, yeah, I want the giveaway so I know what shirt size they want to choose. Uh, and then the custom question, you know, like runner, walker, whatever you set up. Uh, if it's only one athlete type, you, you can disable that to where there's, it doesn't ask them. Um, so that's what I set up for the sign up app. So once you save this, so here's here's what it is. When you push the race to run sign up and you um, uh, have the participant, sorry, have the race director put in their bank information and you've got a registration period that covers uh, you know, the, the, the day you want to do the paperless registration. And then your next step is to enable the sign up app, which I've done here, uh, and you save the settings. At that moment, this is now available. So now you can set up your laptops to where you just plop them down and give them internet access and you're good to go. Uh, so that's that's how that's done. The check-in process is basically the same. You've got a race day check-in. Uh, I'm going to do a mobile app check-in. I don't. I, these are new options. I'm not sure exactly uh, what all these do, but I've always done the mobile app. And then I do the same thing. It's just session two or whatever. Um, you know, you you could use the race name or whatever is easy for you to remember. And then you know, when do you when do you want to allow the check-in process to occur? Well, again, I want check-in to occur uh, throughout the race. So if someone shows up late, they can still check in and register and all that stuff. So I set it equal to roughly whenever I'm going to leave that day. Um, and then once you do this, now on the mobile app on their phone, that race is available. So download the app, search for the race, plug in the password, and now you've got everything you need. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Feel free to throw questions in there. I see a couple new ones, I think. Uh, no, no. So, so if there weren't any questions, I know it's getting late, so I'll try to wrap up the rest of this here. Um, that was the time that I wanted to spend the most amount of time on creating the race and the run sign up interface because it, it frees up you as a timer. It eliminates like half your headaches on race day, not having to deal with all the registrations um, and putting them in and trying to read the writing and all that stuff. Okay. Uh, back on track. Um, I'll show you one thing on the on the phone here. Uh, so on the phone, whenever you do have the check-in app, click on the three bars uh, at the top. Here you go to settings, and I know you can't see it, but it's at the top. You're going to say edit default presets. And then what I do is I make bib number required, because that's that's not required by default. I, uh, let me see if I read it from the screen there. I, um, you know, bib number is checked off automatically. Waiver signed is checked off. I don't really care if the waiver signed. You can turn that off if you want to. All this stuff is checked automatically. I think email is not, so I do turn that on because I do want to know if they, if they, uh, put their email in or not just because I'm curious. Because if someone's standing there in front of me and they say, oh, when can I get results or whatever else? Oh, I got your email, so I'll just send it to you after the race. You know, that's part of the software. It can do that. Um, all right, I do want to see the giveaways. That's not checked by default because that way I know. Because here's the thing. With a lot of races, they have a, a printed sheet with all the names and with the, what shirt size they want. Well, now they can just do that at the check-in area or a person at the T-shirt area can use, use this same app and say, oh, what's your name? John Doe or whatever. And they can see their shirt size there. Um, so I do want to see the giveaways. What, what, what did the person sign up for? And the other thing is I want to see their athlete type or their custom questions. Um and then the final thing I do is I want to allow uncheck in. I want to allow event transfers if you've got more than one event going on. And I want to allow giveaway edits, allow personal info edits. And then if they transfer events, I want to save that bid number, uh, you know, transfer that bid number also to the other event. Um, so that's what I do. Uh, and so when you turn that, where you do edit default presets, then I believe any person that, uh, opens up the app, any of your volunteers now has the ability to change anybody's information if they need to. Obviously, you're trusting those volunteers and not be malicious or whatever, but that's what I do. Uh, that way, again, if, if there's a change, I don't want I don't want to be the bottleneck where everyone's trying to find me. Oh, I got somebody needs help. Brian, where's Brian? No, they can do it all. Um, okay. Okay, let's wrap this up. Let's get going here. Uh, okay, so we covered paperless registration and uh, payment account set up, uh, set a registration check-in period well after they start the race. 
enable check-ins. Yep, clear bid members. Yeah, so that's the other thing is, you know, we talked about clearing bid members. I already showed you how to do that, so that's good. Uh, enable the option to modify participants. Okay, so we're in our last two points here, the day before the race, and then these are quick bullet points, and race day. Um, so the day before the race is you want to print off a, uh, a bid member capture sheet. Now, this is something you can print off from the software. I'll show you how real quick. Um, all right. So view reports, bid number sheet. So um, the the this will automatically default to, to make sure you have enough slots for the total number of registered participants. Uh, but what this is, is let me swap back to the webcam here. Uh, you put this on a clipboard and hand this to a volunteer, and um, what what will happen is they'll be at the end of the finish line shoot. And that's important, at the end of the shoot, not right where people are finishing, because people are obviously sprinting through the finish line at that point. And so this is part of your backup system. And so what will happen is uh, there's two spots here. One says time or – sorry, bid member. The other one says notes. Uh, really, all they care about is notes uh, – sorry, bid numbers. They want to write bid numbers in order. And it doesn't matter if it's 50 races going on or one race. Just write the bid numbers you see cross the finish line. That's all that matters. Uh, and it really doesn't – I mean, hopefully you've told your participants not to cross through the finish line multiple times. But uh, hopefully this is this will match what your chip timing system shows pretty close. This is something um, that if, if someone goes by and – or let's say something crazy happens and you miss a read or a, a, a couple reads in here, you want to be able to look down and say, hey – uh, Joe, you know, John or whatever, whoever's doing this sheet, what, what bib number do you have for uh, position 22? And uh, if you're not sure, because um, let's say you got a manual backup system and they're hitting the space bar, capturing times, and you look over and say, wait a minute, you've got 54 times, uh, I've got 53. So I may have missed one, or you may have accidentally hit the button too many times. And so you want to figure that out. And so what you can do is you can say, hey, John, with this sheet, what bib number do you have for position 31? If his 31 matches your 31, you're good at that point. Uh, hey, what do you have to 44? If it matches, you're good. And you say, oh, what do you have for 50? If it doesn't match, it tells you, okay, wait a minute. Then, then you're working with a small window where you know he wrote down a number that maybe you don't have. That's a tag that was missed or something. And so this allows you to figure stuff out. In a worst case scenario, you've got a second computer where you're capturing times in the software. And I'll show you that um, you know, if you haven't seen that. Uh, so all that is, let's say this is your manual timing computer. All you're doing is you're hitting the space bar. So every time someone finishes, you may hear my camera clicking. Anyways, uh, all you're doing is hitting the space bar for every uh, person that finishes. And so now you've got bib numbers in order, and you have finishing times. And so let's say it's position number 18 that you realize was missed. Uh, then you can look over and say, hey, you know, person with the computer, backup computer, what, what time do you have for position 18? So now you have the bid number and the time, and you can figure them out. And so really your backup system, uh, God forbid, has to turn into your main system. But you can do it. You can figure it out. You know, you can you can get results close enough uh, and hopefully accurate enough. If it's a small race, it should be easy to get you know, perfectly accurate. Um, but for me, I have it uh, being run by volunteers. Now, if I had another person come with me and I knew they're a, a, a you know a manual timing backup pro, then I'm going to trust their results. But I have volunteers run it because again, I'm a one man show, and I split these tasks up. I don't want the person on the computer trying to type bib numbers at the same time. Uh, in fact, I don't have any athletes in this race, so it's not showing anybody. But uh, I want them only focused on capturing times and nothing else. And so that allows them to do a good job and not miss anybody. I want the person with the bid number sheet. Only writing bid numbers out of nothing else. That allows them to do a good job. And so with the bid number sheet and with the times, I can figure out if I have any discrepancies. And again, how you can tell there's discrepancies is because if this guy says, I've got 54 times written down, and I see he's got 54 times manually captured, but I've only got 53 chip times, there's a problem. So then you figure it out. So, um, okay. Uh, so, yeah, that's why you want to print off a bid number capture sheet. The day before the race, you could do it on race day, but again, on race day, I want as few things to have to remember to do as possible. So do it the day before, at least, or a week before, or whatever. Um, uh, the night before the race, you want to make sure all your electronics are fully, fully charged and ready to go. Your battery backups, your cameras, your camcorders, uh, laptops, everything's ready. Um, you want to? Okay, this is a, this is so ridiculous, but I gotta say it. You want to make sure that 
you set like three alarms on race morning. You cannot, cannot oversleep. Uh, you know, if the race is scheduled at eight, but you stayed up till three or four in the morning working on stuff, trying to make sure everything's perfect, and you wake up at 930 and realize your phone was on silent or died or whatever, you are in a world of pain and trouble and legal issues, maybe, who knows what. So, um, in fact, that's one of the things I meant to cover earlier is insurance. Uh, the only thing I was going to do is point you to my friend, Scott Sutter. Uh, I, I can pull up his website here. Um, uh, I don't know a whole lot about uh if I try to get into the insurance stuff, I'd, I'd get in trouble or say the wrong thing. So let me show you his website. There's a race insurer. I think there's a few others. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Um, but he's the question. He's the guy you can ask all the questions to about, you know, what type of insurance you should have and um, uh, whatever. But it's strategic risk transfers. So that's one of them. Uh, I've met him, nice guy. So I think he'd be a nice guy to, to answer questions and stuff if you had him. Um, Okay, back on what was I talking about? Uh, manual timing, let's see. Day before the race. Yeah, set three alarms. So you cannot oversleep. Um, that's just that's just a big one. You just can't oversleep. So I would set three alarms, but also have them on two different devices. So, you know, have your phone and maybe have the front desk supposed to call you. Who knows what? But, uh, you know, or have your wristwatch where it's the alarm is supposed to go off and your phone or something. You just cannot oversleep. And, you know, as we know, uh, you know, often we maybe get out of work, we go travel to the race, maybe we go check out the finish line the night before or whatever, and we get to bed late. Uh, maybe we're bringing stuff in to the hotel room so it's not stolen from our trailer or truck or whatever you haul it in. Um, and so it's, you know, often we're not getting a whole lot of sleep the night before the race. So, uh, you know, set, set multiple alarms. Uh, and one thing I'm kind of curious of, I'd like to see this maybe in the comments too. I think when you become a timer, like I, I would imagine that most of us have had this nightmare where uh, we show up at a race and the, the, the dream starts with me. Uh, I haven't had it in a long time, but when I was first into timing, the dream would start where I'd look up and I see people coming to the finish line. It's like Ron Hall and it's like professional runners back in the day. And I'm like, okay, crap, here comes the people. I got to make sure my stuff is ready. And I look down and none of my stuff's ready to go. So like I realized that I'm going to like miss the first quarter of the race. And so I don't know if anyone's ever had those nightmares, but that's, uh, again, some of the reasons why you want to make sure that you're ready to go. You set your alarms. You don't oversleep. Uh, anyways. Um, okay. So let me go back here. Uh, set three alarms. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So one of my other things, if you're brand new to timing, yeah, you know, I've mentioned this earlier, plan to show up at least 30 minutes early, earlier than you think you need. Um, so that's another tip for the day before the race is, uh, don't assume you're going to have all the time in the world to set up and don't assume that, you know, oh, I set up once in my yard in an hour. This should be fine on race day. No, because you may have to figure out where stuff is at um, and all that stuff. So, all right, race day. We are finally here. Uh, how to dress on race day. I mentioned before you want to dress about 15 degrees hotter or colder than it's really supposed to be. Obviously, in the springtime or summer, dress like it's going to be hotter and so on. Uh, set up the registration tag check dynamic. Um, so I'll just go quickly. Uh let me let me go ahead and pull in the athletes. I've, I've, I've left required bib number off. I go ahead and pull the 10K people in with bib number 100, and let me do the 5K. Yes. All right. So I've got athletes in the race. Um, so it's race day. We're going to do registration. I already showed you how to set up the uh, the sign up uh, apps on the website. Uh, worst case, if you're not using that or if you know, you're know just doing paper registration, you can pull up the uh, the software here. And basically what I tell people is everything in the gray box is required and you have to have this right. So this for the results to be right, these have to be right. Um, so if you ever get behind setting up your finish line, don't don't think that you're going to have time after registration finishes or before the first person comes in to set your finish line up. What you need to do is. Uh, you know, and I hate to have you do this, but this is what you're going to have to do because you, your finish line has to be ready for finishers. And so if you need to take 20 minutes and train a volunteer just to say, hey, you're going to get these forms and put this information in and distress to them, this has to be right. You know, just this box up here, you know, put in the name, put in the right bid number and all this stuff. Put in, you know, make sure you select the right race. And then you have someone putting in people while you go finish setting up the finish line. And then you can come back here and have people put in, uh, you know, put, yourself, put the interest in yourself if you want to. But um, so this is how you manually put people in. Um, 
I do try to get, of all the optional fields, I do try to get the email address if I can, simply because the software has the ability to send everyone an email with the run sign up link and their individual results uh, and all that stuff. Um, all right, tag check. So this is a big, this of all the, the kind of unessential features that are not, uh, that, you know, luxury features, this is the one I'd, I'd recommend that you use. Um, so race day tools, tag check. Uh, let's do 5K, 10K. So this is where you can take a bid. Uh, and I think I left. Okay, yeah. So I can scan it. That one's not doesn't belong to anyone. Let me see if I can find someone. And so when participants scan their tags, it'll show all this, all their information. It says, "Hey, let us know if anything's not right." And so uh, on, on on 95 plus percent of races I time, big or small, there's at least one person that registered online wrong. And the problem is they don't know they did. Otherwise, they would have told someone or they would have fixed it themselves or whatever. And so if Amber registered as a male by accident. And that's not caught till halfway through the awards are given out. No telling how that jacks up the other side once you actually fix it. It could be that some people that received awards have already left shouldn't have received awards, right? So you want to make sure this stuff gets, gets squared away before you uh, do results. Um, because, again, when, when she doesn't know she registered wrong, everyone's going to look at you as you made a mistake, you the timer. And the race director, you know, obviously their, their naming reputation is on the line along with this race. And so if they can – I hate to say this because not all of them are this way. Most of them aren't. But some of them, if they can throw you under the bus, they will. So if, if anything's wrong, uh, it's on you. And so this feature uh, will help you uh, catch any problems is the tag check. Now, another feature I'd recommend is if you right-click and do verify age and gender. I think I showed this last week. This will highlight any potential problems. So it looks like that in the past there was a race with the name uh, or participant with the name Kim, a male. Or actually, no, this one is because the person is zero years old. But this will highlight any potential problems where if this person, uh, you know, if this name was used as the opposite gender last time uh, or if their age is over like 95 or less than, you know, three or whatever, it'll highlight like, hey, this is a potential problem. So it looks like in the past there was a female Tim. I guess that's what this is saying. Um, wish there was a better example in here. Uh, Chris is often sometimes a female name. So um, in fact, there is a male and female right there, Chris. Um this will simply highlight any potential problems. That way, if you get a large file, you don't have to sit there and eyeball everybody. Just use this feature. It'll highlight the ones that you might need to be aware of. And then if they're okay, just skip past them. Um, yeah, that's how that is. Uh, that's how that works. Okay. Um, dynamic bib assignment. We've already talked about that. Uh, you know, just do it on the phone. And then when you hit sync, it pulls in only those that actually showed up. Um, let's see. Setting up. Oh, so one thing I'll talk about real quick. Setting up your camera. Um, let me swap over here. So if you have a Canon camera, this uh, is automatically configured by your computer when you hook it up. So there's no, it installs its own drivers and everything. Uh, this software also works with Nikons and other ones, but I recommend Canon. Um, but the one thing you want to do, let me unplug this so you can see it. Now I can't, I'm not going to have you wait while I scroll through and find it. Uh, but the one thing you'll do is there's a setting in here with a brand new camera where it's got like power save mode. You want to turn that off because what will happen is after 10 minutes of no activity, the camera go, will go to in the sleep mode. And when the software tries to trigger it, obviously it won't do anything. So the the camera uses almost no battery. It'll last just about all day, uh, even if it's taking pictures. So turn that power save mode off, and that way you don't have to worry about that not working on race day. And again, the actual configuration is simply – Plug the camera up to the laptop. The laptop, you know, the drivers install automatically. The software automatically finds it, uses it, no problem. So, um, if the software isn't finding it, um, uh, I don't know. Um, I don't. You know, often it could be just simply turning it off and back on. Uh, you can try trying a different USB port. Uh, it could be that maybe who knows what's going on there. So, um, usually it's a pretty easy thing to figure out. Um, let's see, setting a camera, camcorder. So camcorder, I've got it back here. Uh, so camcorder is not attached to anything. You just, and that's why it's a shame not to have a video of your finish line because the features you can do with it when it comes to uploading it to YouTube, sharing it with everybody, or even better, linking it with the run signup results. And I think race roster and race entry can now do that where you can link the video to the results. Um, but that's something that it's free for you to do. It's, it's a backup system. So why not? And camcorders are so cheap. Uh, you know, memory cards are cheap. So get you a camcorder, put it on a tripod or whatever, 
and record the finish line. Um, again, it's a great backup system in case there's ever any disputing. Because it's, it's 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 a handful of times a year where someone says, you know, whatever, and I have to go look at the video and say, no, actually, I, you know, everything is right. This is whatever. Um, yeah, you know, someone will accuse another person of cheating. Oh God, this person never finished. Like, no, here they are. Here's you know, whatever. So it can be. It's always nice to have a video backup. Um, let's see. And again, it's not hooked up to anything. You just the, the hard part is remembering to start recording when you see the first finisher come in. And so that's the hard part. Um, it's not uncommon that I, the first person goes by and I'm like, oh crap, let me not, and I hit the button. So. And, and, you know, you could turn it on when you think they're going to come, but then you might have like 10 minutes of nothing that that's just more, you know, time to have to upload and, uh, you know, whatever. So, okay. Um, getting all the computers. Uh, yeah, so I talked about getting computers updated after registration. Again, if you've got the sync option, I'll, I'll switch over here to the – let's say you're not doing the paperless registration and you're actually – registering people manually if you've got uh you could use something like google doc let's say you had a large race you weren't using the paper registration but you you're typing them in manually that's that's if it's a large race you just do paperless but uh, if you if you don't if you can't for some reason you could uh have everyone putting them into separate excel files or to a share google doc and then you can import the, all those into the software uh, but the point is at some point you're going to have all the entries into one computer and Assuming you're not using paperless. Again, if you're if it's paperless, just hit sync on all the computers and you're done. If it if it is not paperless and you're having to put in an import or or import, then uh you have to copy the database file. So I'm gonna plug in a jump drive. Um and then the actual database file, often it's on my desktop, like right here it is. So this file contains everything. So even if you just installed the software, if I emailed you this file and you had the software pointing to it. And you can see where it's pointed. Let me close out this. So this path right here is this file, okay? So uh, if if you download this file, if I emailed the, you this file and you downloaded it or replaced, replaced your file with this one, you would automatically have everything just like you set the race up with all the participants and everything. So if you have multiple computers you need to update and you've been manually putting in registrations, you ha usually what you do is you copy this file to a jump drive. Now you can do this the safe way, which is in the software. Uh, so what you'll do is you go to race day tools, copy this database. And you'll see when you put your mouse over, it says, you know, hey, this is usually done after registration. And, you know, uh, that's kind of hard to see because it's going off the screen. Let me do it this way. Copy this database. And it says from this PC to a memory stick. So if I do this and then I select the jump drive. And it says the database. OK, so, it's you know, there's already a database with that file name. I'm going to replace it. Yes. So now that file, the jump drive, right here, you see, uh, did, uh, yeah, copy successful. Let me pull it back up. Yeah, there it is. So see the date time? So, uh, so that's the safe way to do it because here's the mistake that I made one time. Bad mistake at a large race. Uh, it was the, uh, the only big mistake I've made uh, in all the years of timing. Like big mistake, and I, I was scrambling to fix it all throughout the race. As I, I copied, and we we had like five races that same weekend, where I was timing Thursday, uh, Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, and then uh, I drove to wherever this race was, the Hog Eyes, where it was Hog Eye Marathon, uh, I like I don't know, three or four thousand people in it. And well, I copied the database backwards. It was after registration was over that day. And I decided, you know what, the safe thing, because they wanted us to leave all the registration stuff down there. Uh, I was like, I'm going to copy the file to a jump drive. Well, I pulled up the jump drive to manually do it. And because I was working with uploading results from the previous races I'd done, uh, done I, I was used to the file, the main file I was needing, being on the jump drive. And so I mistakenly copied it backwards and overwrote the database file. Uh, not a good thing. So you just if you hadn't had enough sleep or whatever, use the safe way. Go to Race Safe Tools, copy this database. Uh, and then that'll be on your jump drive. And then now on your other computers, you can pull up um, really any race, but you can pull up that race and say, OK, now I want to replace this database. So let me make this smaller so you can see it. So replace the database. So if I click on it, actually, so you can highlight over it from a memory stick to a PC. So you can click here or here. Uh, so now this will take that database from the jump drive and replace the local ones. So that way you don't have to worry about where is that path? You know, where is the... Where's my database? Where's the software pointed to? So now it's uh, replaced it and updated everything. So 
Uh, that's how you update the other computers, um, is by moving this file. So this file has everything. And it's a small file, like, I mean, less than, uh, let's say, five megabytes. And this has got a lot of races in it. So the software automatically groups things by years. So let me show you. This has got tons of races in it. This is not my database. It's somebody else's, but he times quite a bit, it looks like. So anyways. Um, all right. Uh, syncing participants across. Okay, we're talking about that. timing. So we'll fly through timing real quick. Uh, timing multiple races. Um, basically, the way it works is if you if the races are going to overlap at all, or if you're worried about tags being picked up uh, while you're timing one race, even though you know it's, let's say you've got a cross country scenario where it's JV boys, and then you know after that one's done, then they're going to start the JV girls. So if they're going to overlap or even have a chance of overlapping at all. Uh, in most cases, you're going to want to pull all races in the clock screen, okay? even if one's going to start after the other. Um, again, the one reason why is because that way if a 5K bib gets picked up while you're timing the 10K, it knows to ignore it if that race hasn't started yet. Um, but let's say uh, that these races, let me reset them back to zero. And all these actions I'm doing, you can find under the action keys right here. So F2 restarts the race back to zero. Now these actions, if you want to print results or whatever, you have to do it per that selected race um, because I don't want you to tell it, hey, I'm going to restart this race and you restart the wrong one or both of them. You know, you, you can select which one. So the way this works is if you don't check off any race, then when you hit the space bar, it assumes that you want both races started. So both of them are highlighted. So both have been started. Um, if you wanted to only start just the 10K first, oops, I didn't know. Then you check off just the 10K, okay? And then you hit the space bar. Now there's also a little USB plunger you can use to start it. So now just the 10K has been started, okay? Now I can click on the clock to make that list go away or so, by the way. Um, and now I can adjust that time for any race by doing this here. Uh, but this is how you manage multiple races. Uh, so again, if I tried to enter a 5K bib, which is, let's say, 138, you see it won't take it. Hit the okay, nothing's happening. Or if I scan, try to scan that tag, nothing's happening. Um, and so that's how you set up, actually start the, the timing of races. Now, let's say you're manually timing. Let's say, let me go and start the 5K. Uh, so there it goes. So now if I plug in, let's say 145, and I realize I made a mistake and that was really 120, then of course the software, like I said, you can just double click on it, change it, and it'll automatically fix the time. You see that? Um, so... Um, yeah, so that's that's how you can swap any information in here. Um, let's see, capturing. Okay, capturing chip starts. That's another common question. People are wondering how to capture chip start time. So let me do that. So the way you capture chip starts, if you go to the RFID readers tab, capture chip start, and do start listening. Uh, the readers are connected. Everything's ready to go. Uh, I can scan some tags, and you'll see some activity happening right there. Uh, let me. I have a whole bunch here. Can, um, grab all these. So what's happening is we should see uh, ship start differential start showing up uh, whenever I scan a tag that actually belongs to this race. So I think I've got some here. All right, so let's see here. I think all the tags I have are like 800 and up uh, that I know are legit. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Um, I wasn't thinking. I got to start the actual clock. So when you capture a chip start, I was in a rush. And, uh, so you, you tell the readers to start listening, and this gets the readers on and active, and you can, like I said, scan tags and confirm it's working. Uh, but I forgot the, the system isn't going to be tracking chip starts until the race actually starts. Now you can preset someone's chip start time, uh, but I've got to start the clock in order for that to happen. So that's, that's why the times weren't showing up. Now you'll see here that it's going to auto save the chip starts every 10 seconds. So every, or maybe it's 15, I don't remember when it was, but, and I can, yes, 15, so I can up or down that. But as I, um, as I scan tags every 15 seconds, you'll see now, uh, that it will update that list badly. So if you were, timing race, and let's say it's going to take five minutes for people to get through, then you can watch the athlete list if you want to get the reassurance that, okay, yeah, all these people are being picked up. Now, what's nice with this is that if you did the dynamic bid assignment, you're only getting people that truly showed up. So what you can do is you can look at this list, 
And I can click on any column and sort it and see, okay, hey, these people haven't been picked up yet at the chip start. So this is what you can do to kind of confirm that you're getting or missing people. Um, so that's how to do a chip start. Uh, again, if you needed to preset someone's time, you can do that by double clicking on it and saying, well, they actually started at uh, you know 6.30, maybe, maybe it's an early start, 6.30, uh, zero, zero, and I'm gonna hit save. And so now that person is gonna have a two hour and 58 minute you know, uh, chip start uh, differential. So um, let's see here. Manual timing. Okay, so we already kind of halfway covered that. The manual timing, you just hit the space bar, and then as you type a number in, um, let me. Now, one uh, one thing I should mention is I'm still I still have it checked capture chip start. So the software, as I'm entering in bid numbers, it's actually updating the chip start time. So if you were doing like a stair climb race, and instead of doing like or any kind of race where maybe you don't have a chip start system. But it's maybe like a one-on-one -on -one, because there's some stair climb races where they start one at a time, like every 15, 30 seconds or whatever. So you could capture chip start and manually say, okay, hey, here's bid number four. Now, if you watch bid number four right here, Jake Anderson, whenever I type in four and enter, now he's got chip start time. So you could do that as your chip start um, and, uh, and you know manually put them in. But let's say that we're done capturing chip start, so everyone has left the starting line. I can uncheck this, and at that moment. Uh, now, uh, if I were to type in bid numbers and I just write a tag, let's just do uh, 12, 13, 14. You see how it fills in the times. Now, there's multiple ways you can do this. Some people like uh, WebScore. I can't remember the other systems that are out there where, you know, whenever I type in a bid number, let's say 44, uh, unless I have some empty times, do you want whenever you press enter time, uh, the enter key that it captures a new time? Or do you want it to where it fills in the first available time? So the default is it fills in the first available. Some people say, well, I want it to where it captures a new time. So you can do either one. Uh, or you can have a kind of a hybrid where it's like, hey, I'm going to mainly capture times. And I'm going to enter bid numbers as I can from the, from the sheet. You know, the person will call them out to me. But maybe as you're doing that, let's say you see someone coming and they're all by themselves. And you want to put like a little marker in the road to say, I know this time and this bid number is accurate as of this point. Then I could say 78 and do shift enter. And so even though I have this unchecked, it'll put a new timestamp with that bid number. That way, when I go back to filling in bid numbers based on what's on that sheet, if I get down to 76 or 78, and I know that it's like, wait a minute, uh, the next one on his sheet isn't 78, that tells me we're off somewhere. I hope you follow me on that. That's that's kind of a, a tough thread to follow in your head there, but uh, I hope that makes sense. You can do a shift enter and force a timestamp with the bid number entry, even though this plus time isn't off. I like to not have this off um, because, you know, it's, it's just it's the way I think. So, okay. Um, let's go ahead and scan some tags. Uh, I'm just going to just flow through a whole bunch here. All right. Um so one common question is, how do you stop the clock? Uh, there is, with my software, there's, uh, there is no such thing as stopping the clock. The race has either been started or it hasn't been started. Uh, now, if you close the clock screen out and you pull it back up, it looks like it's exactly the way, like, like the race has been running in the background the whole time, which is not true. Um, so uh, the way it works is the software simply continues showing you the difference between when the race started, and remember this date over here, uh, and now. So I, I could actually change this time, my Windows computer, and it would change the clock time. Now, it wouldn't change the times that were stored up to that point, but it would change the time you see on the screen. Um, so, in fact, let's just bump this back an hour. So, um, now I actually change the race start time. So it, when I do that, it changes the times. Um, and so, in fact, that's what's going on whenever you change this time here. I can change this back an hour, uh, and now at the times we're back where they were. Um, so yeah, so just be aware that you, you and and that's one of the beauty, uh, beautiful things too is that let's say that you uh, totally butcher and you miss capturing the start for some reason. I mean, like you totally miss it and you have no idea what the real start time is. I actually had that happen at a race one time where the race start was like two blocks away, and the race director started the race like eight minutes early. 
and I was still doing registration. And so uh, I had no idea and I should have had a volunteer with like a stopwatch or something, but I didn't know, you know, she's going to start that early. And so I had no idea what the real clock time was. And so let's say that, you know, what you do in that situation is you turn the readers on and you time the race like normal, like nothing's going on because, you know, it's perfectly fine. You still have to capture these date time stamps of when people finish. And so let's say that you see Josh, Josh AG here, you know, he captured his own time when he finished. And if he did, uh, then you can say, hey, what did you get in your time there? If he says, oh, I ran, a, you know, 18-14 um, or whatever, then you can simply adjust your clock until his time shows 18-14. And at that moment, your clock is exactly like it should be the moment the race started. So I could keep playing with this, but you get the idea. So I can either move the start time up or back, or if, a, if one particular person uh, – you know, needs his time adjusted, I can do that. So let's say Josh, let's say he's the only person that had incorrect time. I can change it here. So, okay, um, stopping the clock. So you do not want to reset. Now, you can you can test the, the race the day before and simply press F2 to reset it. Like I said, the, the clock has either been started or it hasn't. Um, if, you, if, you, if you reset this race back to zero, it clears everything away like you're starting from scratch. So when you're done timing, simply close the clock screen. Now you can print results and do all that stuff uh, by doing hotkeys or, um, you know, let's just do overall results here. Um, it'll process them and spit them out. So I'll print or fire up in a second and spit it out. All right, let me think to the question. I know it's late. I'll wrap this up. Uh, let's get to the questions. I was just looking at Rumsdown up and it says that the sign up app is being retired, so people should use next mode. Oh no! Uh, it also allows cash payments. I, I know that they said it allows cash payments. I, just, I hope it's as easy as the, the, uh, the sign-up app is. That's that's my concern. Um, like I said, I looked into it, but that's, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, all right, Raj, video camera recommendations. Ah, uh, man, I've used everything from the Kodak ZI8 to uh, the Sony Handycams. I've used the Polaroid all-weather action cameras, which are like 70 bucks. Um, looking back, uh, the one thing that's nice is if the camera, because some of those action cameras don't have a screen where you can actually confirm this recording. You flip a switch and it's, it's got a green light on it. And it turns out later I found that it didn't record anything. So, you, you know, preferably whatever is a cheap lap or camcorder that you can uh, see that it's actually recording. Uh, so I do use that the Sony Handycam a lot. The Kodak ZI is a good one, like I said, but it's, you know, old retired model, but if you can get it. Um, so, you know, stuff like that uh, is good. And, you know, I wouldn't worry too much if it's weatherproof or not because, you know, typically you have your camera under a tripod or you can you can protect it one way or the other. Um, all right, Rod, top finishers with a handful of people. How do you do this pickup? How far ahead of time would you? Um, so with if it's a really top finish and they're like side by side, there is a good chance that uh, that's, well, I've said good chance. There, there's a better chance that this system can get them in the wrong order. Uh, so this is, and, and by the way, the software, you see all these yellow entries? That's what these are. That means it's a close finish. And so uh, I think in my software, I've got it to where if it's within you know, 0.4 of a second or 0.5. Uh, I watched a video the other day where race results says that you know, UHF is uh, accurate up to like 200, 200 of a second, I think. Anything less than that, it's, you know, it's a good possibility it could get them backwards. Don't quote me on that. That could be wrong. But I know that they acknowledge also that, and almost everybody does, UHF, if the timing company tries to tell you that it's, you know, they can get it in the right order at a thousandth precision or whatever, it's, it's, you know, they're doing something special that nobody else knows about. But, um, yes, UHF isn't built to be like a finish link style system. And by the way, this software does interface with finish link. So, uh, um, if that's something you know about, but so if you start a race, uh, and I type in a number and I give it a couple of seconds, type in another number, you see it's not highlighting. At the moment, two coming together, and it highlights, you know, hey, that's a potential um, swap. And the only reason why I highlight this is because if you're timing cross-country races, then it's more important that you know, hey, these are the – of the 200 times I have here, there's like six, you know, uh, records where there's close finishes or it could be more. Then that gives you a quick reference on here's the ones I need to go back and re-verify. Re so. Race thing is there a way to know how many runners start? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so at the top here, let me go ahead and do the chip start again. At the top, it shows you starts. Uh, keep pressing the wrong key here. Uh, so let's do a chip start. And I'm going to hit the space bar. Next. 
but when it refreshes here in a second, I scanned a whole bunch of them. So you see here at the top now it says 84 chip starts. So um, that's how you can know how many actually started. So the, you know th this is the benefit if you did the dynamic bibathon it where it only pulled in people that it thought started or who actually checked in, then you would get an accurate number of uh, total participants, total chip starts, you know, of course, total finishers and how many is on the course. Now, if you did not do the dynamic bib assignment, the software does have the ability to scan DNS tags where you can take tags. And uh, um, now I'm right now I'm currently doing a chip start. So let me take that off. Um, but I can come over here and say scan DNS tags. And while this is up, I can scan tags and it'll automatically mark those athletes uh, of all the bibs that weren't picked up as did not start. So that will also update this number here. So now I only scanned one tag. You'll see that, hey, okay, well, we've had 84 chip starts. We had one DNF. Uh, and so its best guess is 416 participants. Now, of course, some may say, well, why don't you base it off the chip start? Because, of course, you could have people that, you know, um, you know, don't have a chip start time for some reason. But, I mean, maybe that is a better way to go about it. But right now the software handles uh, total um, participants as, as its base. Uh, all right. Okay, so we are done timing um, the race. What do you do afterwards? So uh, real quick, what I do is I take my memory card, uh, plug it in. Uh, let me go ahead and go to run sign up. Let me pull it up over here. And wrong. Okay, so go to the race. My races. Photos. Upload. Date. Finish line. And I simply drag and drop the photos over here. And Run Sign Up does a good job. And I think uh, Race Roster now does this. Um, I can't remember. I'm not sure if Race Entry does. Now, all good companies. I like all of them. So I hate to kind of give a big, big preference to one. Uh, but it's, you know, again, they're. The technology and what you can do with it right now is it's uh, run time's got a leg up quite a bit. And, and they're usually the first, uh, like when the tax thing and, you know, all things going on, they, they seem to, they're just, they're just on their A game all the time. So, uh, but I drag and drop the photos here. They've got Google Vision and stuff built in to where it automatically reads the bid member and maps it to the person. So when people go to view their results, it says, oh, would you like to see your photos? I mean, really cool stuff. Uh, and also, my big thing is whenever I get done timing, I don't want to say, oh, for your photos, go to this website. For your video, go to YouTube. For the finish time results, go over here and whatever else. Right? I want to have everything on one spot. And so uh, that's where I push everything to run sign up. Uh, and so I do the same thing with the video. So after all the photos are done, uh, now typically they, it's about a 50, 50, maybe even less than that of the, uh, dynamic with the, uh, where it does a Google vision and reads the bid member. Um, so I usually, I'm the OCD guy that will go through every photo and tag everybody, uh, manually or just make sure they got it right. You don't have to do that because people could just navigate through the photos themselves, but I go ahead and do that extra work. Um, and then after, uh, finish timing. I do upload the video to YouTube, and then when you do that, there's a uh, uh, option here where you go to edit results. And I don't have results. So let me push up results real quick. So I'll show you that. Uh, so let's get some times in here. Uh, readers read. All right. Yeah, I've got a roll attack here. Find a roll through. I don't have my camera hooked up, or you would hear it taking pictures. Uh, all right, so now we've got results. Let's go to publish results. Okay, so now all the results are on run sign up. So if we go back and reload so now here's the results now we can actually uh see it here if you want to see it um let's do results so yep yeah, there's all that uh oops and let's go back over where was that here so now you can go to video settings 
and set up a finish line video and it tells you like hey on the YouTube video here's the part we need you plug that in and then here's where it says when the when your video first starts if you can see the clock when it first starts what was that time and so if if if, if the first finisher came in at like 1812 and you started your video at like 1815 I'm sorry 1805 then you'll just type in uh 00 colon 1805 uh, and then if your video ended before the last finisher came in, you can put in an end time if you wanted to. Um, and there's different options here. I usually use what I do is I figure out when the video started, what was the time? Um, and I put this as all zeros here. And if you don't, if you don't know what the time was, of course, simply watch the video. And if you see that, and even if you missed the first finisher, if you saw that, okay, I started recording at finisher number three and just look at his time and then see, okay, well, 10 seconds in, I got finisher number three. Obviously, uh, take 10 seconds off of finisher number three's time and then put that in as the start time. So that's what you do there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and save this. Let's see if I can make up something just for fun. I don't know if this is going to take it. Um, and so now if we go to the 5K results, um, we should see. Yeah, that's, oh, I'll put in a time that's after uh, video settings. So I need to put in, let's do, let's do a minute five. See, their times are four minutes and I put in an 18 minute time. Uh, so hopefully that took it. Yeah, so all you do is you link the video this way. And now when people jump to that video, it'll jump. Now this is no telling what race, probably one of the last races of time. I know it's in uh, the adventure race, the mud run. Um, so this will jump straight to that part of the video that shows their finish. So. Pretty cool. Again, that provides everything. Uh, and then when the race is over, um, and this is our last talking points here. I'm sorry, it's, it's much later than I thought. Uh, I will so upload the photos, upload their videos, upload their results. And then when the race is over, I will send uh, everyone an email. And I can do that by uh, selecting the option here. It looks like I don't have. OK, so I got a handful of email addresses here. Obviously, imagine this is hundreds of people. Um, you know, I got my username and password here. For my Gmail account, you can use any uh, email provider. Um, you can set it up there, and then I'll type in a subject. You know, thank you for whatever, uh, or I'll just call it like you know, test results and uh, photos or whatever. Um, and then thank you for supporting this cause, blah, blah, blah. And because uh, it'll automatically include a link to the run sign up page if it's linked to run sign up and it does the same for race roster and race entry. Uh, but it also, if it sees the race has been started, it automatically clicks this option that says include personalized results. And then you can decide if it's based on gun time or chip time. By default, the software always uses chip time because if gun time was not captured, uh, sorry, if chip time was not captured, it uses gun time anyway. So uh, using chip time as your safe option, uh, and that's what I do is I always default to chip because, again, it'll always use gun if it's not available. So, um, And, of course, if you capture chip start, typically you want it based on that chip. Um, um, so just be aware of that. And so now uh, if I hit send, uh, it'll send everybody an email with, you know, hey, thanks for coming out. And this is where I tell everyone, hey, if you mistakenly went home with your tags, here's my address. We do like to get those back, um, you know. Hope, you, hope to see you again next year or whatever. So this is the email I send out to everybody. And then the final thing that's left is to get paid, right? So you can use the invoice feature. And again, you can totally customize this yourself to where I can, even if I wanted to print it off while I'm at the race, I pull in to say, hey, I'm invoicing for these two races. Uh, and I can put in, you know, my base fee and whatever, and it calculates everything for me. So it looks like we didn't meet my minimum or something. Um, oh, no, actually we did. Uh, so it's, uh, it looks like, and I have to check and see, this may be an old report I haven't updated, but it would, it would calculate the right timing amount and make up an invoice number and everything. Um, so you could use this or do your own, but when you send that invoice off, you're good to go and you're start, you're ready to think about the next race. Um, all right. Uh, I know it's super late. This is like three hours. Uh, so we'll call it quits here. I hope, let me see if there's any other questions and we'll answer those quickly. Probably no, no other questions because it looks like probably everyone's asleep. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Sorry it's long. I hope you learned something new. Uh, even if you don't use this system, I, I hope that uh, uh, there's maybe some tips in there that you enjoy uh, or that you can put into practice whenever you go time uh, races. So 
Um, I was going to talk about timing cross country races and how to set those up and relay races, software does all that, some time based races. I was going to show you an example of that. Um, and then how to do a wave start, but we'll save that for next week uh, or the last week where it's just questions. Let's just cover whatever. I uh, hope this was uh, okay for you. Uh, next week will be more just for uh, AG Race Timing users, the software users. So if you're using other systems, but you just want to chime in on this one or watch this one to kind of see, well, let me see what other timers do and what all the you know, uh, protocols they have to make sure things go well. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, next week is more just the advanced features of, okay, let's set up a results kiosk. How do you do that? Um, uh, you know, and all the other features that are there. So anyways, I guess we'll sign off. Um, yeah, appreciate you guys.